Amen. Now let me say that ask questions that are very important and um, I am not under any obligation also to answer all questions. If I consider your question funny, I might not answer. Hope that is okay. I praise the Lord. Because on a day like this, there are all kinds of questions people come up with. So let me see, first of all, I was told that some after second service started dropping questions already. And then they will project some. And then if you want to ask here, they will also allow those who are watching us online to ask questions and they will find a way of passing it across to me. So if you have a question right now, you can lift up your hand. I can give you a number. So we start from there. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for ability to answer questions by your grace. We'll receive unction to answer and to minister in this area in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the reasons why we are doing this is the fact that people go to church. They listen to, uh, they, 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 op they do opening prayer. They do praise worship. Uh, they listen to the message and they go home. And that is the cycle that you see just about every Sunday, every Wednesday. Uh, you hardly see a time when opportunity is given. But when Jesus was here, people used to interrupt his service to ask him questions, and he used to answer all the questions. Amen. Some of them, he didn't tell them what they wanted to hear, but he gave them an answer that he wanted to give them. And it becomes very necessary to do this because I have discovered that all over the body of Christ, so many people don't exactly know the doctrines of Christianity. People tend to do what is popular with their church, what is popular with the people that they identify with. Uh, when I was announcing this in church, that okay, one afternoon we'll just come back here and ask questions, and how more people will join us? You know, this is not service, so those were people have people left after service. You know, but I just made an announcement when I was talking about this, and I mentioned the fact that if you if you don't know whether what to practice, what you believe, and what you are practicing is rooted in the word of God or not then you can belong to a category of people that the Bible says, do not follow the multitude to do evil. So that many Christians are doing it does not make it right. And that nobody is doing it does not make it wrong either. It is the word of God that defines what is right and what is wrong. And if you don't learn to look through the word of God, you, you tend to follow the assumptions of men. For instance, which I gave on Wednesday, there are many of you here, ladies, you are not covering your hair. You don't exactly know from the Bible why you don't cover your hair, whether it's right or wrong. You just believe that you are in a church where they don't cover hair, so you join them. Supposing your church is deceiving, you don't know. And remember, we are not going to start as a church, stand as a church before Jesus Christ. We stand as individuals. Some of you are wearing trousers here. <laughs> you don't know whether when a woman wears trousers, she's going to hell. You don't have, you understand what I'm saying? You don't have conviction from the Bible. You just do it because you are in nature where they wear trousers. So you, two, you just wear and there. And there are many practices like that that Christians do. So on almost every subject matter, when you call somebody from Catholic, somebody from Anglican, somebody from Redeem, somebody from Christ Embassy, somebody from Deeper Life, and somebody from all churches, and you ask theological or doctrinal questions, all of them will give you different answers based on what their church believes. Yet we have just one Bible and one Jesus Christ. It is because Christians are in the habit of following what their church is doing without actually checking from the Bible whether it is right or wrong. Amen. Hallelujah. So in this church, ladies don't cover their hair. What about if I've just been deceiving you? And when the trumpet sounds, as we are going up through rapture, your ear will pull you back. Like a vision that a dear sister shared in one church. That was what she saw. That the woman was going, well, I'm sure, that trouble sound, she was going. And then the hair, her hair brought her back. I said, that must mean two things. The angel that was pulling her was confused. Because the angel didn't see at first that she had weave on. First took her halfway. <laughs> then saw the weave on and brought her back. It's amazing the kind of visions. I you know many times when people tell people that I, I, I slept, I saw heaven, and I saw an angel of the Lord sending people to, and people tend to believe all those things and they live in fear. But that fear will not last. It will last one week. One week you are walking like this. 
you can almost apologize for killing a cockroach. But after one week, when I was secondary school, every time it was raining heavily, people would start thinking about rapture, and you will see repentance on beds. Especially in the night, thunder, rain, people would start, when you come and collect your people, remember me, O oh Lord. You know that's And after two weeks, <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. So let me know. Let's start straight away. How many Bible questions here? Can I see your hand? Uh, who is starting? Now, this is what happens every year. When you say who is starting, people will be looking at you. Now, when it gets to number four, it becomes difficult to control. Then everybody suddenly asks a question. So we are starting this way. Okay. There are mic. Okay. Uh, our mother there, she's raising her hand. So it's going to be the first person. This is what we do. If you have questions with you, when I answer one with somebody here, you can project another one. So we do one here, one like that. Yes, ma. Now, also, this is the rule. Every question asked, just go straight to the point in 30 seconds because we have limited time and we don't want to be here for too long. I will understand the angle you are coming from. Trust. Just go tell us. Um, so if I call you, don't give us background story. Um, tell us exactly the question. Yes, ma'am. You are welcome, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, sir. There is a mic there. Okay, yes, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening, everybody, or good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma'am. Please, ma. my question is this, because it worries me a lot. Every yes, time in the church, they preach about forgiveness of those bad people. People that are killing, people that are doing so many things that yes, we should pray for. Like this afternoon, this morning, you show us that... It's good for us to pray for our enemies. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So, you get one big enemy where we get for our village. No, yes, it's not a laughing matter. This one is Kuro Kuro Eye. You yes, know, look at my age. Yes, ma'am. Even when I tell my children, I want to ask you so that I want to, uh, because we learn every day. Yes, ma'am. We learn every day. I want you to clarify me very well so that I will understand very well. Yes, ma'am. I will start, whether we start to be praying for forgiveness for him. <laughs> This man is the chief agent demonic powers in the world. Wow. In my in, um, our own, my husband's uncle. So, villages knows him. He's proud of his buttons. One day, he came to me without doing anything. He said, I've been seeing you, you don't want to die. But this time, anywhere you are going to do your own juju, this time I make sure you will die. Face to face like this, I say, what did I do to you? You are my husband, brother. I haven't offended you. I never abused you since they married me. But I learned that you are the one that killed my second son, 29 years old, a Navy boy. What have I done to you? Now you say you want to kill me. That type of man. Yes, ma'am. Doing so many things. Yes, ma'am. I understand, ma'am. Please. <laughs> okay, ma'am. Help me to answer. To Thank tell you. me what to do. For that, to do. Whether we continue to pray for him, for God to forgive him. Amen. Because he's still there alive now, proud of his baton. Thank Amen. you, everybody. I'm serious for what I ask. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's a very important question. I understand, Ma. Now, this is common. Yeah, we live in a world where we have evil people. Evil-minded people. But you see, over the years also, we have seen evil people who cross over from their evil ways to the side of the gospel. This is God's perspective. The greatest victory is not for an enemy to die, it's for an enemy to repent. That's the greatest victory. Satan is driven mad when he has used somebody and he cannot use the person again. Now, that means he has lost two ways. He can't use the person again and he has lost a soul that cannot come to hell. Are you getting what I'm saying? If a wicked man dies in his wickedness, he goes to hell. At the end of the day, Satan gains one more soul in hell and he rejoices over that. If we deprive the devil of additional soul in hell, that is the best way to punish Satan. So God's plan is that all men should repent. All men means everybody to be saved, including native daughter, witches and wizards. However, God is also a righteous judge. Whether a person eventually decides to die or not, it is in God's hand. As we pray, it said if your enemy, um, the Bible said that, that if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And the Bible says that 
if somebody hits you, turn the left, the second side. It is because God wants us to be playing. And we are not responsible for the destruction of anybody. But that kind of person, if he doesn't repent, eventually God himself will fix him. Whether somebody is praying against him or not, God is able to bring him down if he wants to. But let it be that not because I utter the word of a curse unto him, no. So on our part, the Bible says we should forgive those who offend and it to any kind of offense. On God's part, he knows how to deal with a man who feels he has power. So we leave the judgment to God. We do our own part just to pray that God should have mercy. Keep praying for the salvation of his soul. When you do, two things will happen. It will either be saved or it will be destroyed. One of the two. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes? Next. Yes. Please, those of us with microphones, stay in different places and don't be too far from the people that are... Okay. Is surrogacy godly? What was that? To help somebody carry a baby. Right? Okay. So, somebody um, is someone's sperm put in another person for a woman maybe that is infertile or she cannot carry someone that, can, someone that cannot carry a baby then another woman carries on a, uh, that's a tough question. Pastor Money, what says that? <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason I will say but I want I want a woman to answer for. So a sorrow gets godly. Okay. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't know why he asked me, but um, I'll just say this. What I believe is, um, I think it's a medical procedure. I don't understand the details. I think Pastor Bele would better understand the details. But in a way, there's a lot of medical um, advancement that has been made. And um, there's blood transfusion. I've had to take a couple myself. People have um, bone fractures. I think they put some steel rods. So if there is something that is going to help somebody and um, it's not going to interfere or try and, um, how do I put it? It's not going to interfere in God's plans or look at it a bit like adoption. If or IVF. How about IVF? IVF is even a step further than surrogacy. IVF, the baby actually is, um, in court, implanted everything in a test tube. And this has helped people who could not, who did not have any hope whatsoever to have children. So I don't believe it is a sin. I don't think, I don't think it's a sin. I don't think the Bible does not tell us that because that hadn't come then. But I don't think it's a sin. However, if, um, if something doesn't sit well with you and you have the spirit of God, it's better you don't go ahead based on some words. But if, as a child of God, with the spirit of God, personally, I don't believe it's wrong, but you pray it through, the spirit of God will lead you in what to do. Praise the Lord. Okay, Dr. Billy, just a word, for, say something about that. Okay, I think that um, in, the, in the medical condition in which a woman cannot carry a baby and um, she and her husband desire to have a baby, um, most ethicists would agree that there's nothing wrong with that. I think the question usually comes from two areas. The first is when the woman does not just lack a womb, she does not have the eggs and the eggs now have to come from the surrogate mother. That now that presents a problem because it's not really her child and she's going to take that's number one and the other one is when it's not altruistic that means this person some people don't, don't want to just carry babies so they want someone to carry it for them and the person is doing it for a fee and well, you're going to get three million at the end of the day that's where the problem is but in the strict where there's a problem with the womb of a woman she cannot carry a baby and she needs someone help to help her. Sometimes it's the woman's mother that does it, the grandmother of the child. Uh, I think that's, that's um, okay. All right. 
I hope the question has been answered. Praise the Lord. Let's move on. Next. Okay. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, sir. So I have two questions to ask. Okay. My first question is from Joshua, chapter 10. Um, when the Lord delivered the Amorites to the children of Israel, uh, Joshua prayed that the sun should stand still. And the Bible said the sun stood still. My question is, was the sun moving before? Because scientifically, we know that the sun has been I got a question. standing still right Move. from the beginning. Then my quest second question, um, sometimes um, during the PDP regime, some children were captured by Boko Haram, and some of them were forced into becoming a suicide bomber. And at the process, they end up taking their life and killing some other persons. Um, when they died, um, where will their fate lie? Because they were captured at a very tender age and they were forced against their own wish. God will not hold it against them if they are forced. Hypnotized and forced to do something. When you say something is wrong, it comes from a will. When your will is not involved, when you are forced to hypnotize, it's not like that. Now, to answer the first question, the art, we all know that the, the, um, the sun. The earth rotates around the sun. Um, when he said sun stands still, actually what happened was that the earth stood still. But there was no understanding like that at that time. So it was recorded the way it occurred to them. For a long time, the old world thought that the earth was flat until some other people found that it was spherical shape. So, but that was what they thought then. So when Joshua said sun stands, God just did what he wanted. Joshua wanted him to do. They needed the lights to conquer the enemy. God answered. But the terminology that he used was wrong. That's it. Hope I answered your question. All right. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yep. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, sir. I have four questions. <laughs> okay. All of them, five seconds. Just say them. All right, and you once said that if we tarry too long in a situation, it means there's something we're not doing right. So how do you differentiate patience or long suffering? Not at all times. All right, then um, the second one is, is faith a goal or a process? It's both. All right, um, the third one is this, culture in Christianity. Uh, most times when you get to read the Bible, you find the role of culture. How do you separate culture from Christianity? right yeah. now. Okay. Then my last question is this. I read about sexual unity in marriage. Now, how does premarital sex affect it? The culture. How does it affect? No, that's another question. The last question is, I read about um, sexual unity in marriage. My question is this. If you've had premarital sex, how does it affect sexual unity in marriage? Sexual unity? Yes. Okay. What's sexual unity? <laughs> Now, that's why I need to, you know, it's very important you clarify. What's sexual unity? What's the definition of sexual unity? My definition of sexual unity is when both of them come together to become one. I, um, there's this saying, um, when you get to sleep with someone, both of your spirit is one. Now, in cases where you've had sex before you get married, what actually happens? How does it affect? Okay. So start with the third one about, I think I've answered the first two, about culture and Christianity. Um, um, Apostle Paul in some of his writings, it will say something like, I, not the Spirit of God. Now, when he got to communion in 1 Corinthians 11, for instance, I said that that which I received from the Lord, I am giving you. That means he's saying that this communion is a direct revelation from God. So there were things that Apostle Paul wrote that were inspired by the Spirit of God. There were things he wrote that he said that this is my judgment and I think I have the Spirit of God. He said that now, there was something he said, he said, but this is not God, this is me. So, there are some things you can easily see that. When he said me, it might be cultural things. About um, communion, he said, I received it directly from the Lord. So, when you study the Bible, you'll see combination of all these things. Some things evolved from Jewish tradition, and then some things directly from the Word of God. So, there's also, but when you read, it's very easy to know. The, the, the difference is. But every time Paul dealt with cultural issue, he actually mentioned that this is me talking about cultural issue. Like when he said women should cover, they said nature itself teaches. 
So he was saying that in our culture, and that's why not if you go to Tunisia, Egypt, all women that women that are from that area where Bible story actually originated for they still cover their hair now. So certain things are from traditional point of view. So that's that's it. Amen. But you will see the aspect as scriptures are scriptures, traditions are traditions. So some other things happen like that. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Okay, last one. Uh, that's um, again. Okay, say so how it's a, how premarital sex. Now, you see where our attention should be is that whenever a, a believer goes wrong and he repents, there is forgiveness. Now, for a woman or a man, let's say for instance, for instance, now if a lady, so it's also a question of how far has the person been into that thing before coming into marriage. For instance, now, a prostitute would have been, I don't like using that word, I don't like calling people prostitute, but people that are on that side in that sense, who have slept with different men, who have explored all kinds. Now, imagine her marrying a brother that is very spiritual. There will be some but where there is love and where there is spiritual growth, all things can work together. Now, for a guy also, maybe somebody taking Viagra regularly, having sex with all kinds of ladies, now married to a church girl. Now that they are married, it will show that they are coming from, they are operating on two different wavelengths. However, it is also possible that the unity is actually where there is mutual satisfaction as they grow together. It's all about where there is genuine love in marriage, whatever has happened before the marriage can be corrected within the marriage. That is the truth. So that, so whatever is coming before the marriage sexually cannot or should not exactly affect what goes on in the marriage. If the two people can have understanding and one person will know that he has to take it easy with the other person. But together, they reclimb us together. It's, it's a fact. All right. Okay, praise the Lord. Okay. There are people out there who do not tight but are prosperous. Why then should I tight? There are people out there also who don't pray and they, pro they are prosperous. There are people out there who are not Christians and they are very healthy. Is that true? There are families out there, they are not Christians and they are living well. Is that right? Your concern should not, a Christian does not look at an unbeliever to validate the word of God. You obey the word regardless of what is happening outside. So I cannot say because certain Americans don't pray and they are living well. So why should I pray? That would be a foolish thing for me to say. God didn't tell me to look at people out there to now look at the word of God. And the Bible says that, let me say for instance, now, although I, I will teach on tithes a, a bit, a little bit different, but let's just say, I am reading from Malachi that says that uh, if I don't tithe, uh, this and this will happen. And I'm like, okay, all those guys out there don't tithe. Why should that? Nothing is happening to them. That would be a, a consequence. That, that's a very terrible mistake. That means I am looking at men in the world to determine whether the word of God is correct or not. And God didn't tell us to look at anybody we are not, it, it didn't tell us. Are you with me? Praise the Lord. The Bible teaches that when you pray in the spirit, you edify your spirit when you pray in tongues. That means you have the ability to perceive more. Everybody knows that the more you pray in tongues, the deeper you get into things of the spirit. But witches don't pray in tongues and they see into the realm of the spirit. So, so imagine somebody saying that, why should I pray in tongues for my spirit to become alive and be full, to be fully charged? Witches don't pray in tongues and their spirits are charged 24-7. Did you get what I'm saying? So it's, it's a wrong comparison. I've seen it on Facebook. I've seen it in many places. No, people should not do that kind of comparison. You do what the Bible says. Now, if you say that, okay, what does the Bible say about that? Uh, that's a different question. But to say that there are people out there, people out there are doing different. There are politicians who are very rich, and it doesn't mean they are prospering. Are you following me? Uh, okay. And I've also told people before, don't make the mistake of, you don't know what people do to have their money. All right? Okay. Um, let's just leave it there. So that's it. So we are not supposed to look at outside and be saying that. So we don't draw that kind of comparison. I hope I've answered your question. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
Ok. Yeah. Um, there is a, a aspect of the Bible, that's the book of Job, that's always puzzled me for two reasons. They said, I'll, and I'll be asking two questions from it. Go on. They said, um, the children of God, the sons of God, came up to heaven to, to, see, to, to witness God's presence, and the devil was with them. That's the first one. Um, I want to know why the devil should have permission to get there. Okay. <laughs> and the other one. <laughs> well, that's a good question. Yeah. The other one, the devil and God are the wager. Never go that day. A wager, like a, something like a bet. Okay. That have you seen my? Have you observed my my servant Job? That and God allow the devil to punish him, except taking his life. So I want to ask, why do the righteous suffer? Because I've witnessed that a lot. Why do the righteous suffer? I will start with the second one. The Bible says that um, they that must live right will suffer persecution. So. Now, actually, people are not attacked, whether they not, not, people are not attacked because they've done something wrong or not. From time to time, the Bible says Satan goes around like a rhino seeking whom to devour. He can pick on any family. What Christians have is ability to resist the devil. Now, the idea of resist actually suggests that it will come. At different points of your life, you're going to face many battles or different battles. So it will come, but we have the ability to resist him. So the righteous don't everybody faces a challenge at one time or the other. Now, for if you are righteous, you are already a marked man. The devil doesn't like you. You'll be marked. So it comes more for you. So there is what we call the attack coming against you because you are doing right. All you need to know is, that's what the Bible said, above all, Ephesians chapter 6, take on yourself the shield of faith with which you quench every fiery dart of the enemy. So the darts are always coming. The question, do you have a shield of faith to block it? So you don't have to do something for the darts to come. Even if you are, like you said, righteous man, Satan will still fire the darts. But your righteousness in Christ Jesus gives you ability to have a shield of faith to block off darts. Okay. So as for the first one, well, God is a just God. Some things in the Bible, sometimes you might not be able to differentiate types and typology and from what is real. Now, whether Satan appears physically there, we are not sure. But let's put it this way. Revelation chapter 12 says that, and they overcame by the blood. Like I said, the Bible says that there was war in heaven, and Lucifer was dethroned. And the Bible says that he was there accusing our brethren day and night. Why would he be, why would he be allowed by God to stay for a long time accusing brethren before they finally decided to dethrone him? God won't stop Satan from coming on a visit if he wants to come. So, <laughs> in the time of Job, he showed up there. The sons of God gathered and gathered with them. He was allowed. Now, God did not ex exactly, he was challenging God that he came to tell God, like the Bible said in Revelation, that it's always it's called the accuser of brethren, that Job was serving God for something. And God said, no. Now, he said, he said to God, he said, you put your hand and see how Job is. And God said, no, I don't do evil. It is you who does evil all around the world. So he said, um, so what God did was that, now, I, um, I don't want to <laughs> preach, but let me give you a bit of revelation of what really happened. If you study from Job chapter 3, what you are going to discover is that Job said in chapter 3 of Job that the thing that I have feared has finally come upon me. Job, God surrounded Job with a hedge, but Job created a loophole. Satan doesn't see it, but God saw it. The loophole was fear. Job was doing sacrifices day and night because he was afraid and he said that something will happen to his children. God knew when you operate in fear, you're out of faith. So what God did was just that. He showed the devil what the devil did not even see. He couldn't enter, but God showed him the loophole. But God allowed him. Things happen to believers at times. If it is something bad, it doesn't come from God, but God can allow. You understand? He can allow. So that was what happened in the case of Job. And Satan wanted to hit Job. He couldn't, but God allowed him to do it. And then God was able to prove his point. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Let's go on. I was molested as a child and I've been dealing with the emotional trauma. How do I let it go? The first thing is to forgive. That might be the hard part, really. But you see, what happens is this. The Bible says, confess your faults one to another. 
uh, 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 James chapter 5, verse 17 to 19. He said, pray for one another that you may be healed. Healing. If you are not... Now, this, this question is actually very serious because I have met ladies, I've counseled ladies before who actually told me that after years of marriage, after having one or two kids, some of them will tell you that they cannot have sex with their husband more than once in a year. And in all the cases of women who have told me that it's a case of abuse, the first introduction that they had to sex was a brutal experience, was a very regrettable experience. And because of that, the traumatic effect is still here. They will think they've gotten over it, but every time now, the genuine, the legitimate, legitimate husband trying to hold her now, the picture of how that uncle grabbed her and did that will come back and she will resist it. Every now and then. I mean, somebody, might somebody telling me that uh, what she had to go through, every time she had sex with her husband, she had to drink. A Christian. Before, because that was the only way she could release herself. Otherwise, everything in her system would shut down. Because of what happened. Somebody violently raped her. Somebody that she really trusted, respected, and I think the thing continued for a while. So, because of that, all through the time when she was in school, sex was just like, like, you, like when you tell somebody that, uh, freeze, I will shoot you. So she didn't want to hear that word. And the husband was frustrated the first one year of their marriage. What is going on? I mean, we are, we are married now. What's the problem? And she was telling me that it was so bad that she would have to least command, switch up the light, <laughs> sit here, do this, do that, do that. Even the command as a man will shut you down. Just be like, you know what? Okay, I'm not doing it again. <laughs> if you, so that is why, um, if you have, if it's a secret thing that you are covering, you might need to find somebody that you can talk to. Maybe in the place of authority who can actually pray with you and help you. But the thing has to come out. If it stays in, it will affect you. It will affect you. You know, I told them something last week. For a seed to grow, Almost all seeds, you have to cover them. When you drop corn on the sound, it might not grow, except to open the soil and put it and cover. Whatever you cover also will start growing within you. It will start growing. If I want to kill some seeds, if you don't want some seeds to grow, just open them up, they will not grow. Either ball to come and eat them or they will just not grow. But when something is covered, it will start growing inside. So you, you need to actually let out this thing. So one of the ways in how, how to let it go is just to talk with somebody. Somebody, I think for this person, somebody has to pray with you. You have to let the person know exactly what happened. A person that you can trust who will not broadcast your story, but that can pray with you and you can find healing. That's the Bible said, I pray for one another that you might be healed. So you, you will be healed if you do that. It's important. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's go on. You know, it grieves me when I hear stories of molestation, honestly. I, I just don't understand why a man will just grab somebody and force yourself on the person. And I, I, I was told that, a lot, I read this, that a lot of men don't actually know the traumatic effect of, of rape. They think that they've just had their way. It is deeper than that for a woman. You've just messed up her life if you do that to a lady. It's terrible. Some of them will do as if it doesn't mean anything they can go on with you. But the reason why you made the person not to be complete forever is what you have done to the person. And if you're a man and you're watching, you think about the fact that you are going to have a daughter. Some things you just don't do. No is no. That's it. You have self-control. Hallelujah. If you want to have sex with a woman, first of all, marry her. That is the price. So pay. You can't have access into the holies of holy without buying the altar court. It's a parable. <laughs> Some are still trying to grab. <laughs> I have been really broke for a while. Then I got to learn that I can donate my eggs and get paid 300k. Is it a sin to donate my egg because it does not sound like a corrupt way of making money? <laughs> I understand you. I sympathize with you, but I will strongly say no. Don't sell any part of you for money. If you are donating blood for people who have had an accident and you are doing it for free, fantastic. But when it comes to selling, I'm going to tell you that no, no. You see, what you discover that inside you, it's not a question of whether it's sin or like that, but inside you, you are going to feel somehow about it. God didn't give it to you for you to sell. It's a different ball game if you are helping somebody with it, but to sell, no. Trust God to prosper you another way, but not to sell something as precious as that. Amen. All right. 
um, let's take a live question once. Okay, yeah, please. This brother is always asking questions anytime. Make it short and direct, sir. Thank you. So the, the first Adam was tempted by the devil. Yes. Then the last Adam was tempted too. Yes. But in the case of the first Adam, the devil, that is the serpent, came to Adam. But for the second one, or the last one, sorry, the uh, Jesus Christ was led by the Spirit of God to the devil. Yeah. Why was he set up? In quote, I call it to you. Why was okay, why, why was, was Jesus set up why, by the Father? Yes, because he must prove. So, in Matthew chapter four and in Luke chapter four, that's the account of the temptation of Jesus in the uh, in, in, in the wilderness. Adam was. Uh, the devil told Adam something. He made an offer. If you eat, your eyes will be open. You become like God. Adam fell for it. And he committed what we call a treasonable offense. So he committed treason. He sold out to the devil. For Jesus to be a perfect last Adam, an offer must be made to him also, and he must say no. The first time Jesus was able to overcome Satan was to overcome the temptation presented to him by Satan. So if Satan didn't come to tempt Jesus, it will not be the last Adam. Because the first Adam was tempted in the garden. So the last Adam must also be tempted in the wilderness. So Satan came. So God led Jesus to be tempted so that he'll be able to fulfill his role as the second and last Adam. That was what happened. So that was why he went to the wilderness. That was, that was why he was, was tempted. Amen. If God didn't allow Satan to come and tempt him, if that did not happen, what the first Adam lost will not be regained completely. So he must do the same thing. He too must be given an offer, but he must say no. So the devil told him that I will give you the word if you bow. And Jesus said no. So that qualified him to be the second and the last Adam. As in that, his mission didn't fail that way. Amen. Yeah. What is that? What, what is that people? Why is that? Why is, okay, why is, why, why, why is that people who work so hard to achieve their goals always have a setback? Does it mean that God is not with them or does it mean that his grace is not for them? Now, you see, don't use someone's experience to judge or to say who God is. There are many people who work hard, those who are very prosperous. So it's not a general truth. Now, if this has happened to you, I understand. You can say that, why have I been working hard and it doesn't look like. There are many people who are working hard and getting blessed and getting blessed and working hard and getting blessed. God recognizes and supports uh, hard working. For instance, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22, 29, See that a man that is diligent in his business, he shall stand before kings and not before ordinary men. So God perfectly submits or supports people working hard. Labor is part of it and it's very important. So God will bless a man that labors. Now, there can be occasions where people are putting in so much and they are receiving so little. That's why the Bible says in the book of Psalm that it is in vain for you to rise up early and sleep late and still eat the bread of sorrow. For he giveth his beloved sleep. And that describes the experience of many people in Lagos. <laughs> they should put Lagos before that scripture. They wake up early, they sleep late, and they still eat the bread of sorrow. They leave home 5 a.m. and they come back. So there can be situations. Now, sometimes it is for a while because you are building into something. At other times, Working hard does not mean you are working smart. An adjustment might have to be made. As a matter of fact, many times when, you're, uh, being, when your diligence is going to give you prosperity, you will likely need to adjust how you do what you do. You are still doing it, but there is an adjustment. And that, when you tilt it a little, it changes everything completely. And that's a different, that's a, a, a message on its own, really. And we need to know you to know what to do. Then we can tell you at times by the Spirit that, okay, from the word of God and from experience that so you can adjust this and do it this way. It is true. If you are into fashion, for instance, now you realize by now that that Pareto principle operates every now and then. 20% of your customer bring, they bring to you 80% of your profits. It is true. What wise people do is actually to locate that 20%, give attention to them and expand with those 20, 20%. So if you have 10 people out of 50 people patronize you, so these 10 people are the ones who really give you money. Others, they pay on credit. That credit is saved. You collect 5,000 for a share. You collect five times. They give 5,000 on Monday. 1,000 on Monday. 700 on Wednesday. And that's how you collect. Even the money you're using to enter, to call them. You spend the money calling. You locate some people who are to what you do. And it takes a lot of wisdom to do that. 
and then you can actually expand the, your scope with those people. Amen. All right? A young man who desired the office of a bishop, but along the line, he fell into sexual sin. We God still use him perfectly. God will use him very well. Amen. Hallelujah. All he needs to do is just to get up and move on, turn to God, he will use him. Praise the Lord. If God will look at past sins to determine who to use and not, then he won't use anybody. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Let's go on. Any hand up? Okay. There's a sister over there. I'll come back to this after. Uh, so my question is, is there anything like permissive will of God? Because in my home church, I've been um, taught that there's something like that. And a case in point, an example that I've um, come across is Hezekiah. Where the person said, um, God had 15 years to his life. Yes, and five years after, he had Manasseh. And Manasseh yeah. made Israel to sin such that God said he would yeah. wipe Israel as a man wiped a bull and turning it upside down. Yeah. Yes, so then the, person, the person's point was that if that, that it was actually the will of God for Manasseh to go at that, for Hezekiah yeah, to, to go, go at, at that, that time. time. If he had died, he would not have had Manasseh and all that. And my second question is um, concerning um, if you are. If you, if you come into the knowledge that somebody you know, maybe a family you know, um, for example, a friend, you have, you, you have a friend, and you get to know that the husband of that friend is involved in um, extramarital activities, is it your place to... To report. Yeah, not report, per se, but should you mind your business or... And that's in that you <laughs> because I'm asking that because personally, if I were in the place of the the party, the wrong party, I think I'd want to know. I won't count to a friend if you know that kind of thing and keep I, quiet about yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Now I will come back to this. Let's start with the first one. Okay. Now I have heard people say that Ezekiah had Manasseh. That was why. Now to start with that, before we answer permissive will, now that was not. If you read Isaiah. 37, 38, and 39. That's where you find that story. Where uh, what exactly led Ezekiah into trouble after 15 years that God added was not that, was not the 15 years, it was what he did within those 15 years. Babylonians came to visit him and he took them to the temple, showed them everywhere. So God said to him, because he was sick and he just recovered, he wasn't supposed to be displaying gold and showing them things. And he did. And God said, I see. All the things that you let them see, they are coming to carry everything away. Now, he acted foolishly beyond that. When Prophet Isaiah told him that, that who were those people that came to visit? He said, ah, they are from Babylon. Isaiah said, what and what did they see? He said, I showed them everything. I took them, I took them to my bedroom. <laughs> and God said, Ay, you should not have done that. that. All the things they've seen, they are coming to carry everything. Now, instead of Ezekiel to say, Lord, I'm sorry. You know what he said? He said, Lord, you said they would do it in the time of my son. He said, that's good. There's no problem. No problem. At least there will be peace in my time. That's a very terrible thing for a father to do. If he said God should forgive, the same God that had 15 years to his life would have forgiven him. Just like Adam. You know, Adam never said sorry to God. When God said, who asked you to eat the food? He said, this woman. He never said, God, I'm sorry. God has never turned down anybody who asked for mercy. But Adam never did. That's why those of, those of us who are very uh, heady, you are wrong. You begin with your siblings, now your wife. You are always right. Even when you know you are wrong, you continue to argue and argue and argue until everybody surrenders to you. And you feel like a champion. So now you carry the same thing to marriage. You argue, argue to establish your point that she, you know, no, no, no. And when you do that, you are going to get in trouble one day. So that was what led to Ezekiah's problem. You understand? It was what he did that led to the problem for Manasseh's son, the prophetic word and everything. Now, as per, um, he prayed and God had 15 years. God cannot do anybody's life. Now, whether that is permissive will. Now, the definition of permissive will. People brought that from Romans chapter 12. Uh, if we start from verse 1, I present, I, I, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the minds of God, to present your body as a living sacrifice, only an assembly unto God, which is your reasonable worship. Do not be conformed to this one. Now, the Bible says that, uh, but be transformed by the renewing of your heart, that you may prove what is the perfect, 
So that's where they, they took it from. That there is perfect will, there is permissive will of God. Since God said, prove the perfect will. Now, the idea of permissive will is very deep. Yes and no. Yes in the sense that you can be doing something that is not exactly God's plan for your life and it can leave you. Pa Elton was the man that brought Holy Ghost teaching into Nigeria. An Englishman that God told after years of pastoring the church. One day he was praying in the church and God said, Elton, my son, when will you start the assignment I've given you? <laughs> and Elton said to God, I'm sorry, what have I been doing <laughs> all along, preaching to people every day? And God said, no. You go to Elisha, Elisha in Nigeria. You live there and you die there. Piotr was one that raised Pastor Kumi, Abishop in Daosa, Pastor Adewe, it was Piotr that did. So he came to Nigeria and he didn't come to Lagos, he went to Lagos. God told him Elisha directly. Now, when he was pastoring, he was allowed to pastor, but that was not God's perfect way for his life. Did you get that? Praise the Lord. Kenneth Egin was pastoring. Then as he was praying one day, he was feeling dissatisfied. And God said, that, no, I want you to be a teacher, teacher and not pastor in the church. So all the time when he was pastoring for about 10 years, he was, in, he was not at the center of God's will, but he was permitted to be. Now, this is the dangerous thing, and this is what I need everybody to be careful of. There are some permissive will, in quotes, I'm using that word permissive, I don't want to, I don't reckon with it, but in quotes, that can kill. And there are some. Now, God can be saying to a person that relocate, 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 if you don't on time, something bad can happen. Because God is sending you, he has seen the evil and he wants you to avert it. But when you stay, something happens. So, the, so, so there are cases like that. So we have permissive will in the sense that you can do things that are not exactly God's perfect way for your life and God can allow you to do it for a while. But after a while, you will know that you have to stop. So that's about permissive will. So what's the second question is um, about to tell or not to tell. It depends on your relationship with the person and the maturity of the person. That is very, very important. Now, this is where you don't want to find yourself. There are people you will tell, at the end of the day, they will both make you feel sorry for talking. I learned some things early in life as a Christian. Now, this wasn't about marriage, but about a pastor and the associates. When I tried to tell the pastor something, and I got into serious trouble, even though years after, he found out that I was right, when the pastor stabbed him and stabbed him well. But see, it happens like at times. So it has to do with, number one, your closeness to that person, the level of the person's maturity, and the timing. It's very important. So there are times. It, will, it can be a uniform, it can be the same situation with, it can be the same with every situation. In some cases, the better you keep your mouth shut and just pray for them. And in some other cases, you can save the woman by letting her know something. That's it. And then let me also say, most of the people will come and tell you later that, ah, you are my friend, and you saw this and you didn't tell me. If you had told them, it might have not meant anything. If I had to get into trouble. People like saying that, that why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? Really? <laughs> I, I've seen ladies who now, you know, when they were going around with the guy, everybody told them that. People tried to say, this guy, he doesn't mean well for you. Yeah, no, 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 I did it. And then they wanted me to talk. Also. But I won't say anything. And I told them that you know me by now. I must come for your wedding, so I won't talk. If I talk, you will not invite me for your wedding. We say, is the guy okay? I will say, ah, it's okay. I might do something wrong. The Bible said I should answer a fool according to <laughs> I have found out eight out of ten ladies, when you tell them, that's the last time you see them. They are going to marry the person anyway. Only that, apart from marrying the person, now they won't talk to you again. That's the truth. So at times, it's better to just keep quiet and pray. I do a lot of praying without talking. Number one, I don't believe in running people's life. So I'll just pray. So I don't like saying anything in that sense. So that's it. So it depends on your closeness and it depends on the maturity of the person. There are some people you should tell, some people you should not tell. More of the people you should not tell. <laughs> Is it wrong to still get married to a person you have had premarital sex with? Now that you are born again, especially when one of them doesn't see premarital sex as a sin, even though they are both Christians. Now, getting married to somebody that you've had sex with, now that you, you consider it as something wrong, it's not the problem. The problem is that the person doesn't see it as something wrong. 
and that's a big problem. You see, your marriage must involve compatibility. And compatibility means that you must believe the same thing. I tell young ladies that are here, if you are in a church and the pastor preaches day and night that sex before marriage is wrong, and a guy wants to have sex with you and he goes to the same church, he listens, he gets back, you go to visit and he's asking for sex. Don't you think you should be afraid of such person? When the pastor stands to teach also that extramarital affair is wrong, why do you think he should listen? For a while, forget about whether it's wrong or right. Look at the attitude behind it. You are in the church together. A man, he calls his pastor, he's saying something is wrong. He's listening. And as soon as he's saying, he's still asking you for it. How do you suppose when the pastor tells him that extramarital affair is wrong, he will keep to it? That's it. And you know what? If you allow him, don't blame him for any other thing he does. Against the teaching of because you allow the first one, he's violating what you have been taught, and you're allowing him, then whatever else he violates, you should take it as personal responsibility. You allowed it to be. So it's a question of does the person, if the person doesn't see it as something wrong, it means that you are not exactly seeing these uh, things the same way, and that is actually very dangerous. Amen. But to have had something with somebody and to realize that this is wrong and to still go ahead to marry, there's no problem with that at all. But the problem is that does he feel it is wrong? That's the problem. Amen. All right. <laughs> okay. Now we answer. It's a, it's a good question. <laughs> I've been asked before so that uh, for a man that, who doesn't like sex, so the wife went to get him some of the pornography films to watch just for him to... And I told them that the problem with that... Okay, if somebody asks a question, I'll answer, but for less is blue job. Why are you laughing? Do you know the meaning of blue? What's blue job? <laughs> <laughs> with your husband, a sin, and it's Anna sex with your husband, a sin. Now, believers must be careful of saying this is a sin where the Bible says nothing about. So on this one, the Bible is silent. I cannot call a sin what the Bible has not called a sin. Are you getting that? Otherwise, I'm adding my interpretation to the Bible. I might consider something wrong personally, but if I cannot find a scripture, for instance, we've dealt with drinking on that note. The Bible talks against excess drinking. But New Testament is silent about drinking. Now, I hate drinking. But for me to come out and say to you that anybody who takes a cup of alcohol has committed a sin, I'll be saying what the Bible does not say. And I'm always careful not to say what the Bible doesn't say. Did you get that? So the Bible is silent about this kind of job. <laughs> so, <laughs> amen. <laughs> so, and the Bible is also silent about this kind of sex. It is truly between the man and his wife. If you are comfortable putting your mouth there, which I suppose is the meaning, when your mouth should be confessing the word of God, um, <laughs> the same mouth with which you are singing worship. Um... The bigger question is, where is that coming from? Sometimes, people want to do all these things because of things we are seeing on the screen. And that is dangerous. Amen. But to look at it as it is, if your partner is comfortable with it, I cannot say, I have no scriptural justification to say that this is wrong. But I would just say that, where is it coming from? Now, if the, you, you own your body, the Bible says that you belong to your husband, your husband belongs to you. So if that is what the two of you like to do between the two of you, fine. We cannot say it's wrong. It might look dead to some other people, but it is you. But the Bible is silent about it, so I, I'm silent also. So that's what I can say. The same thing goes for anal sex. I just know that different parts of the body are created for different reasons. So... <laughs> Your other part, the other part of your body is for a reason. Now, when it is for another reason, I don't know.
I was told that there are, are there medical implications for that. So Dr. Ebele is speaking. He said there are many implications. Maybe you should let him say something about that. Hallelujah. Um, medically speaking, the one of the um, let, let me just tell you that if you go to the hospital for any stomach pain, the stomach starts from the mouth and ends at the anus. Examination of the stomach is not complete if your anus has not been examined. If you go to the hospital and your doctor examines your abdomen and does not stick his finger there, he's not a good doctor. So to examine your anus. I can tell you how uncomfortable just finger o is inside the anus. Now you can imagine a turgid male external genital organ entering that small space. So it, it, may, it may give a sense of uh, sexual satisfaction, but those people have tears in that place, right? That is the place where the man goes to, the, to urinate. They have infections, proctitis, all kinds of things. So medically speaking, it's not hygienic, and it's not from the doctor's table. It's not recommended. From the spiritual angle, Pastor. No, you have answered. <laughs> Hallelujah. I hope that I hope he has answered the person. He said the dangerous thing about this also is that for everything you are accepting that you want to do, you keep finding yourself going for more and more. More and more. What happened to the man that himself and the wife used to watch the pornography stuff was that one day the wife went and by the time she came back, the man was experimenting everything he saw there with the housemaid. There's just no end to this thing. That's why you have to guide yourself and just ask yourself that why am I doing this? If you have a wife, for, I mean, so at times you just have to ask, why am, I, why am I doing this? Now, you've gone around that body. Why in us now? Why are you adding to the list? So those are, those are important questions. I'm in a relationship with a lady. Anytime we met, I always give her money. And when she sees me, she will just be smiling. <laughs> I want to know if she loves me or my money. Amen. Well, one cannot directly answer that. There's, when you give money to many people, they will smile now. They are not supposed to. So that does not exactly say whether she likes money or not. Okay? Money will make you smile normally. If they pay you some amount, if I call you an and I give you 10 million, you will smile now. So it's normal. You, you have to find another way of finding out whether she likes money or not. And maybe you should try not give her money one day. If she wants to break up with you, then you will understand, okay, it's about your money. It's difficult to tell. I said, we know the lady, and I think you should know her better. Is it wrong to still get married to a person you've had prima? Okay, I think we have answered that. Okay, can I take a question again here? Yeah? Okay. Uh, mother here wants to ask a question. Can you give her the mic? You're yeah, welcome, ma'am. Good afternoon. Please, sir. A lot of people are suffering because of... No, sorry. We need volume on this mic. Okay, you are close to the speaker. If you don't mind, can you move back? Because of the speaker, it will make noise if you... Okay. Okay. Yes, I was saying that a lot of people are suffering because of things they don't know. And I'm using a reference of Exodus 20, verse 5, that God said he will visit the sins of the fathers on the children, third and fourth generation. And people come to church for long, still carrying a lot of problems with them. Yes, ma'am. And at the end of the day, they are told that, oh, it was what your grandfather did, what your uh, great-grandfather did. So how do they break, how do you break that curse and be free? Then my second question, sir, is, they said that they, in Proverbs 13, 22, yes, ma that the wealth of the sinner, ungodly, is laid up for the righteous. Yes, How do we assess that wealth of the sinner? Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> okay. I want to read, the, I'm, I'm trying to get a scripture. Okay. I want to read from Ezekiel chapter 8. 
verse, Ezekiel 18, verse 4. The Bible says, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so is the soul of the Son. There is a reason for that. I want to, you will understand the answer to the first question from here. I see a lot of people talking about this. Um, what is it about this thing they call ancestral cause? The word Lord came to me, say this, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 1. If you have, you can project. What many ye that use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten salt grape, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, here, the Lord God, you shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. But all souls are mine. As the soul of the father, so is the soul of the son. It is the soul that sinned that shall die. Did you hear that? God said to Israelites, he said, you guys have been saying that the father sinned. The, the fathers ate something bitter. Now, it is tasting bitter in the mouth of the children. He said, as I live, see the Lord, I will destroy this proverb. So you won't use it. He said, it is the one that eats it that will fill it in his mouth. He said, because the father's soul is different from the son's soul. And it is the soul that sins that die. When people get to know the scripture, they will not be bothered by ancestral causes. Now, can parents do something that can affect children? Yes. But if a child is born again, you have changed the scenario. Because now you are connected to Papa Abraham. Because of the arrival of eternal life, whatever is coming from above cannot get to you. But this is the trick. The devil doesn't play smart. He will try to force it on you. But you have to stand on your liberty, declaring that this is it, and I'm not shifting ground. Amen. Amen. He will know that you know what you are saying when you are not moved. When you are moved and you call for prayer, it means that you don't actually believe that if any man is in Christ, it's a new creation. All things are passed away, including what the fathers have done, and all things are new. So ideally, ancestral stuff is not supposed to affect any Christian. But a lot of Christians have not been taught the word of God and the devil takes advantage of them. So when you see prayers like that being offered, are there people truly there in that combination that the things that their father has done? Yes. But should it be so? No. So anybody that is born again, it ought not to be so. Because you are a new creation and you have actually been cut off from that thing. The Bible says you've been translated from darkness to light. And the things of darkness should have no power over you. When a Christian has been given incisions on your body, done by native doctors. The moment you come out to accept Jesus as Lord, that incision should die. A new master has entered and the old master must go. That is Christianity. But you see, it's not being taught like that in Africa. And it's getting a lot of people into trouble. Watch very well. Those who fight ancestral stuff, they fight forever. I know quite, the deliverance doesn't come to an end. As this issue is being dealt with, this one is being dealt with, because you are fighting an enemy that you cannot fight. You are fighting an enemy that somebody has defeated already. You are going back to a battle that has ended. Oh, glory to God. Amen. We have liberty in Christ. Stand on it. You know, I've, I've seen, thank God that when we go born again, all these things, didn't go, it, it's, it, and it, it's, it's actually going on all over Africa. When I got born again, before I got born again, I, I mean, we were in a particular denomination, my parents, uh, a kind of church. We used to drink water from coconut, water from this, water from that. It did not occur to us to go for deliverance. We got born again. We started preaching. We became spiritual. This didn't mean, it didn't mean anything. And up till now, I have never gone for deliverance in my life before. But when people give attention to all those things, I've been told to lie down before with seven candles around me. I'm taking raw egg. I, I've done all sorts. I didn't have to vomit anybody, anything when I got born again. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creation. All things are passed away. That's all. See, if God opens your eyes to see that once you are born again, something supernatural has taken place. Mm. Hallelujah. <laughs> Who told us this story? A young man. Jesus came to his house. And he had Jesus come and live in his house. And I think they said he has about seven rooms or so. I can't remember the story very well. And he had a knock on the door and it was the devil and he came and he was trying to force his way in and the guy was fighting, fighting and he was expecting Jesus to do something and Jesus sat in the room, he gave Jesus one room in there he just sat in that room, enjoying himself in the room 
when he nearly died of fighting, Satan finally left. Then the king said, Lord, I was on the at the door, and you did not. Then Jesus told him that, well, you gave me a room, and I was in control of that room. I think the, at the end of the story, Jesus told the guy, why don't you give me the whole house? And next time, he gave Jesus, next time Satan came, and he knocked. Jesus just said, ooh, and the devil ran away. So he told the young man, you were fighting a battle you should have left for me. I won't still occupy any room in your house, but just say this house is mine, and Satan will understand the meaning immediately. Did you get that? So, don't fight a battle. So that is it. What's the second man? Okay, the wealth of the wicked. How do we have access to it? It's a scripture also that yeah, the Bible says so, but we must be very careful. I understand you, man, but it has led some Christians to covetousness. When they see a non-believer, they are looking at, when, <laughs> when will this money <laughs> cross to my, <laughs> you better go work and make your own money. The truth of the matter is that the wealth of the wicked, yes, the Bible says the wicked. The wicked will gather, but at the end of the day, it's going to go to the right man. You continue to, so a very good example is, Nebuchadnezzar was in charge of Babylon. He ended up giving the wealth to Daniel. Joseph was in Egypt. Pharaoh ended up making the prime minister and he said nobody could breed without him. So that is it. So when a righteous man is following the Lord and doing what you ought to do, God will command the Gentiles to give to you. He will. He will command people to give to you. And many of them will not be Christians, but it will be legit. He will command people to give to you. There is a program in the school, so we manage the sound. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's go on. Yes, ma. Good afternoon, Pastor. Yes, yes I'd like to know the difference between, um, you know, when somebody says, this is a gift from God. You know, maybe the person sings very well and says, it's a gift from God. Then you have um, a vision and you say, this is my vision. This is the vision God has given me to do. And you say, this is my purpose in life. So what's the difference between an assignment? You say, this is an assignment from God. This is a vision. This is my purpose. This is a gift. So what is the difference between those four? That's a very, very important question. At times, there is a kind of overlap. So we have talents. We have gifts. We have calling. Those are three things we have explained. A person can be called into something. Like a person called to pastor, a person called to be a prophet, a person called to be a worship leader. Talent is what God has given you that is like a kind of skill. So a person can be a talented singer but might not be called to music ministry. Did you get that? I usually say to people, for instance, now, if you have gifts, you can act very well. My Man Zion fame is a ministry given to my Bami lawyer. It's an assignment. But there are Christians who are gifted with ability to act. It does not mean you should start drama ministry. You can be the best Hollywood, Nollywood actress and still be a Christian. Did you get that? So you can be, just like we have footballers, we have those who can run very well. We have those who can act very well. We have those who can sing very well. We have different gifts. So gifts are gifts. Now you have, so they are talents. So now you have a calling. When God calls you to a particular, uh, gives you an assignment, and he calls you to do something, that one will carry the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are also, apart from calling, there are spiritual gifts. Like you have in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you are nine gift of the Spirit. Uh, we are word of wisdom, word of knowledge, gift of faith, gift of healing, design of spirit, interpretation of uh, prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and gift of faith. So those are the nine spiritual gifts. So they are gifts. They are spiritual gifts. They come by the ability of the Holy Spirit. But then, those are not gifts. But you have five-fold ministry. Ephesians chapter 4. So you have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Those are callings. Now, the Bible is talking about helps ministry. And the Bible talks about those who can exhort, administrating. So these are callings. So you have talents, you have gifts, you have callings. Callings are ministries. It's an assignment given to you by the Holy Spirit that you will give account. But for talent, you can choose to use. You, might, you can know how to play Bovera and not play. If I know how to play but I refuse to play, that is not a sin before God. It's just a matter of choice. 
But if I am called to be an evangelist and I refuse to go, that's a spiritual answer. So one is general. One is spiritual. Ministry is higher level. Okay? Praise the Lord. Let's go on. Yes, ma'am? Good afternoon, Pastor. Okay, according to her question. Okay. okay. Are they are they projecting them? Okay. Yes. Good afternoon. Go on. Yeah. Okay, according to her question, you said calling and the rest of it. So, how do you know if God has called you to do something? If God has called you, you will know. Like, will He give you a sign or something like? Yes, that? many times He will give a sign. At other times, the sign is inside your spirit. You will just know. See, God. It, you, you can't make a mistake about calling. You will know that you are called. If you don't know, maybe he's trying to call you. <laughs> he has not called yet. <laughs> when he calls you, you will know. You will just know. There will be something definite that will let you know that this is it. And this is what God wants you to do. It's important. Amen. Also, we have many questions. Project and I will answer, please. Is it good to get married to a man you don't love, even though I have a child for him. What if he doesn't take care of the child? Also, is it wise to marry someone who you are not compatible with? No. Is it good to get married to a man that you don't love? No. It is not a child that should keep the marriage. It's love that should keep marriage. You might have had a child for somebody. You made a mistake. You got involved. That doesn't mean you should marry the person. God will take care of your child. Don't marry someone you don't love. You will regret it. You will regret it. Don't marry someone you don't love. God will say, people have, people have raised, they've raised children alone now. No matter what, I think I need to say this, so no matter what, even if you have had to, I have, I, there are married people that people are asking out. Having a child doesn't stop the right man from coming. You get it right with God. Right person will come. When a man loves you, he will love you the way you are. Adjustments are not necessary. That's the truth. I met a couple one time. The, 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 the woman's daughter was already nine when the man was running after her. This is a man with heavy CVs. Somebody who read. I mean, all kinds of masters. And you wonder whether I didn't see other girls around. He just said that from the first time I saw her, this is the person I want to marry. Then she told her, you know, I have a daughter, she's nine. I don't care. Now they are married and they have two other kids. If I that will let you know somebody who truly likes you, you don't hide all those things. So, but don't say because I have a child, I have to marry the man. No, you don't have to marry the man. You don't have to. If you don't love him, don't marry him. Amen. Okay, and if you are not compatible with him, don't marry him. So all those things, and you get in and you feel like running out. If God should say there is no sin again, some women will kill their husband before tomorrow morning. <laughs> if God says that, you can't be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Master Billy. <laughs> Maybe you answer this question yourself. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, let's read. I don't know if this is right. But I've been crushing and dreaming about Pastor Billy for five years now. I have always wanted to tell him, but I don't know what his reaction would be. There was a day I had to, I had courage to tell him. I woke up to him, but he was talking to someone, and he just said, I am continuing with that person. I felt like passing out that day. Please, sir, what should I do? <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, whoever wrote that question, you cannot force yourself on somebody. There's nothing wrong with having a crush on somebody. There's nothing wrong with crushing on anybody. There's nothing wrong with it. But you see, the will of the other person is involved. The person we are talking about, maybe he doesn't see you in that light, and you have to accept that reality. And now, in Africa, it is the man that chases the woman. Don't chase a man. Let the man chase you. Please, go and fall in love with someone else. He doesn't have your time, really. It's not a main thing. I understand. Now, no, honestly, if you don't, I know how painful it can be that sometimes certain people lock down on somebody and the person doesn't see it that way. It happened, I mean, this, I mean, just like that. 
I've had to almost tell a guy one time, and I've, I've, I mean, what oh boy, I, I don't know that girls. He will, you will send, he could worship this girl. And the girl kept saying that he's a wonderful person. I just don't see him as my husband. And I said, oh boy, you know what? You have to rest. At the point, he was getting angry. What? I said, no. She said, you are the one seeing her as your wife. She doesn't see you as a husband. And you have to accept that reality. It is very painful when people fall in love with somebody and the person doesn't love them. It's very painful. Now, it is more painful if the faller is a woman. It's painful. When a woman loves a man with everything in her and the man doesn't see it that way, it's very painful. You just need to adjust your mind. What will not happen will not happen. Amen. If a woman forces a man to love you, you will regret it. So just let it be. So that's what I can say. My advice to you is that fall in love with somebody else. Pray, pray, pray him out of your heart. And just pray. Amen. And but I salute your courage at least for talking. Hi, right, Pastor Allah, please. Is it right for a sister to crush on a pastor? For years now, and he's not giving her attention. What is your advice? Become a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> that makes the job very easy. <laughs> Amen. I've answered it by answering the former question. You can't force yourself on anybody. How do I know that I'm under the influence of my father's sin in the first place? Okay, I've already answered that if you are born again, you shouldn't bother yourself about this. Jesus Christ has paid for sin. And he paid for the sin of the old world. Now, when a Christian accepts Jesus, you have come into the provision he has made. And because you have come into it, the sin of your father cannot affect you again. Can there be experiences that will make it look like, yes, stand your ground, that in the name of Jesus Christ, I have been translated, so this cannot happen to me. That's all. At times, a fight of faith. Okay, so that's it. What's that? Okay. Uh, okay. Praise the Lord. Okay, so a crush or not a crush? Um, please get a life. You know, say you are crushing after somebody for five years. Excuse me. Can you just have a kind of pride? Just talk to yourself that I am worth more than this. And just move on. Talk to yourself. Because if a man is not giving you attention, there are a million others that have walked past you that you did not see just because you are running after somebody who's not even looking at you. you understand? So the fact that five years, even if it is for one day and he's not looking at you, just tells you that he's not for you, then move on. And then why do you have to even be so adamant five whole years? You, know, you just put yourself on a horse. You understand? Waiting for what will never happen. Believe you me, it will never happen. You know, I'm telling you for free now. So this, that is the answer that you need. It is never going to happen. So just move on. Get a life. And dust yourself and just move on. He doesn't, he, he doesn't know you. Do you get? All right. Thank you. Let's say, okay. Give the mic to her before I take the next one. Yes, ma'am. Okay, he's on. Okay, I'd like to know how exactly one, Take grieves, it one grieves the Holy Spirit. What grieves the Holy Spirit? How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? Okay. And uh, I want to know, does it mean that, okay, once you've grieved the Holy Spirit, no matter how much of forgiveness you ask, you don't ever get forgiven, that you should consider yourself as someone who is going to hellfire. And then secondly, I'd like to know, I have to ask explanation on the book of, um, I think it's Corinthians, I'm not sure, maybe chapter 7 or so, that talks about the covering of the hair. Covering of okay. I thought that, in my own, okay, in my, I'm thinking that, okay, it says that the covering of, the, the woman's hair is the covering of her head. So I don't go to any church and not cover my hair because the church doesn't cover it. Even if I go to Deepa Life, I won't cover my hair <laughs> until they get me a scarf. So I try to have a personal conviction. So I just want explanation on those um, two questions. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, for the first one, grieving the Holy Spirit means doing things that are not pleasing to him. All of us do that every now and then. Our God is merciful. Um, it doesn't mean the Holy Spirit will withdraw. You never know. Although a person can get to a point where the Spirit of God stops talking to you. But the Holy Spirit 
will not leave you because you made a mistake, because you grieve. Grief means that you're taking a decision. It can even be a thought, an action, a step that is not pleasing to him. He just says, daughter, this is not my plan for you. So he's grieved. Many times when the Holy Spirit is grieved by a Christian, uh, he keeps quiet. But when you say, Lord, I'm sorry, he begins to talk to you again. So, but the Holy Spirit does not withdraw from a Christian. Jesus said, I will give you, he said, the comforter will come and he will abide with you forever. The Holy Spirit stays with us forever. So, he, he cannot withdraw because a Christian has, but do Christians do things that are not pleasing to him? Every time. Every time. In our thoughts, in the way we talk, in many things. So, some are just more consequential than others. That's what I can put it. But the Spirit of God in all does not withdraw from a Christian. So he cannot withdraw because a Christian. So that, that could be. Then the second one about is 1 Corinthians 11. The Bible says, if we start from verse 3, Apostle Paul said, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of every woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Before Paul started talking about covering or no covering on head, he gave clear cut definition of the head he was talking about. He said at the beginning, he said, I want you to know. That's why, as if he knew that people would not know. He said, I want you to know that the head of every woman is man. The head of man is Christ. The head of Christ is God. And then he said, if a woman is prophesied without covering her head, he was actually saying that every woman at a certain stage should have a covering over you. And that's your husband. That's what he's saying. Now, as he was answering that question, he brought the cultural perspective in. He said, do you think in our culture, that's how he ended in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, do you think in our culture it is proper for a woman not to cover her hair? He said, so let me tell you, we don't have such culture. Neither do the church. So he was saying that in this uh, community, the culture is a woman should cover her head. So consequently in the church also, women should cover. Now we don't have the same culture. Did you get that? So that's, that's it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So, uh, whether you put scarf on your head or not, it's not the spiritual covering the Bible is talking about. If I heard Brad Bile one time, he, was actually, he actually said that, do you think that God is really, that he said God is talking about something much more deeper, and I totally agree with him, than whether you put a scarf on your head or not. So that's the truth. Praise the Lord. All kinds of doctrines have been fabricated from that. But said that when you cover your head, when you don't put scarf on your head, angel will not answer your question. <laughs> How did the Bible come into existence? Because I'm confused as to why we are living according to the Bible alone. Was it the Bible turned down from heaven or was it from people like us? Was it not from people like us? If you ask the question because you really want to know the answer, I will try and answer you. But you see, when people start asking questions like this, you're already on your way out of the kingdom. Amen. Amen. The Bible answers your question this way. All scriptures are given by the inspiration of God. And the Bible also puts it this way, that prophecy did not come by the will of man. Only men of God were, they, they prophesied as they were moved by the spirits. So, the Holy Spirit inspired people to write scripture. He told them what to write. Moses was on the mountain to write Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The 40 days he was on the mountain, that was what God told him to write. Dr. Luke wrote Luke and Acts of Apostle because he was following Jesus Christ around. John wrote John. Matthew wrote Matthew. Mark wrote Mark. Apostle Paul wrote some other epistles. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit on what to write. And the Spirit of God put them together. So, that is it. If at this stage, you are still doubting the Bible, well, I can't, I don't have anything to say to you. Those of us that believe the Word of God, we see no miracles, that these are not the words of men. Cancer has been healed all over the world. Yesterday, they were still mentioning, you saw the one, even governor of Ogun State went to visit. The governor of the state is not a Christian, went to visit a woman was it 60 what or 50, 61 or 62 that gave birth 67 that gave birth to a child supernatural acts of God enough to let you see but if you still believe you know people ask this kind of question at times you've listened to so many men who have told you things the Bible is the word of God and forever Lord thy word is settled in heaven
That's all I can say to you. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes? Yeah. The same Bible were taking it to villages and they made idols who lie on their faces worshipping Jesus. It is the word of God. Uh, good yes, yeah. sir. Um, I was wondering if you can answer some of the questions that were raised on the advert. That, um, yeah, because there are some things that the question they ask that really needs to be answered. Uh, you tell this me which one you want me to um, answer. <laughs> about um, sh uh, politicians sharing money, the lady that the husband left. No, no, which one do you want me to answer? Just take one. Uh, politicians sharing just, money. Just three of them. Election time is there. Somebody giving you money. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> a believer is a believer. Don't partake of evil. You know that when people come to share money, they are selling their bad, you are selling your bad rights when you collect money from a politician sharing money. So the answer is wrong. It's no. You know, I told them something in the morning, and I want everybody to understand this thing that I've said, which is the truth. Any temptation you are tempted with, the blessing coming is always bigger than temptation. Temptation size will give you an indication of the kind of blessing you're about to receive. It is true. When I gave the example of Pastor Tony Bakari when he was practicing law in those days, and a particular president of Nigeria got him into something, and he refused. He was a young lawyer then. Two percent of that money there would be about 70 million to 100 as at that time. Now, one deal he did in property a few years back in America, one deal in property, he made a profit of 300 million naira, legit in America. One deal in property. Listen very carefully. The size of the temptation. When you are tempted because you are, you are working under a bus and you have opportunity of stealing 2 million from the bus, when you see the opponent of seeing that 2 million, 20 million is coming your way. Say no to that 2 million. When Joseph said no to Mrs. Potiphar, the king of Egypt gave Joseph his own daughter, superior to Potiphar. Only those who say no to Mrs. Potiphar can marry the Egyptian princess. That's the truth. Get, just understand that Temptations will not come to you except there is a glory coming. That's why the Bible says the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Once you see a kind of soft temptation, there is a glory coming. Say no. That's it. They don't get that. Amen. Hallelujah. All the beautiful marriages that I see around, somehow when the right man is about to show, somebody will come first. And fear wants to make you say, if I reject this one now, when will the right person come? The right person will come. God will not forget any of his own. He will not forget any of his children. He will not. Praise the Lord. So, um, if they share money anywhere, don't. You know one of the greatest challenges that we have now? Where is uh, Tonya? A friend came and she, she asked me, she said, the some of you saw the white lady in the church today. Uh, she said, after this, I said she wanted to ask, ask me some questions. And then we began to talk. She told me a lot of what she, she, she's studying why prostitutes are coming from Edo. Because according to statistics, they have the highest number and they were one. So she came to Nigeria to look into that. And she was telling me that she even found out that some of the prostitutes that they, she was saying something like they got to know of a church where people were being told. I said, there's nothing to just bring the tithes when you do it. <laughs> one of the things that we see around is that church people leave church building on Sunday and they go behave like every other person when people are cheating in the office Christians partake Christians get to office by 8.30 they sign in 7.55 like every other person it has made the testimony of Jesus Christ very weak in the world that's why there are all kinds of agitations and attack against the church because we have ceased to be the lights we are blended in and we do everything that others are doing in the community. And it's not supposed to be so. A pastor in Ghana, a female pastor, was saying that she went to visit two people in her church about getting married. And she was happy to promise that she would be at their wedding. She was passing by one day and branch to see them in the house. The husband in his boxer, they were yet to marry, came to introduce the fiancé to the pastor with boxers. They came from the bedroom. He didn't even see there was anything wrong. Too much of Hollywood, Nollywood, where it's a star in Hollywood, it's a normal now that, it's a norm. People live together and they are not married. They are beginning, even in African culture, that was strange. A daughter couldn't leave her parents in the African, traditional African society to pop out and say you are going to stay with a man. 
But you see, all these things are being sold to people and it's affecting the soul of a lot of Christians. So, there will be too many Christians who live just like any other person. When you stand for nothing, you fall for everything. And it's too common. So, they share money of a Christian. How many Christians are in politics and they share with them. They share everything shareable. And it's pathetic. So, where is the place of that we are different? And how then do we minister to them? If we are doing everything they are doing. So, we have to stand out. A Christian man will tell them that you are sharing money. I am not interested in your money. Others will share. No problem. You know, when they say the youths are the, the leaders of tomorrow. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I said, my father was one time local government chairman. You tend to ask that. Is that really, really? Is, maybe it's so in some other places, but in Nigeria. <laughs> when Governor Ebekunle Amosu wanted to become senator, it was a senator before he became governor. My area in Abeuta was under his districts. My father was the head of the community that time. And they chose to have the meeting in my father's house. I came from UI. I just came home. And I saw Mopo. Mopo took control. My brother wanted to enter. The Mopo wanted to use guns to hit my My brother said, sorry, sir, our house. I said, sorry, sir. But they took over our gate and everything. And when the governor was going, the governor, sorry, the senator, he, off, he, oh, he offered money. As a senator, of course, it's a normal thing politician would do. All the old men in the estate, it's an estate, but the people from the community and the estate came to join us. All the old men in the estate turned down the money. Said, "Fix our road as a senator. Won't collect a dime." The chairman of that group, my father was the head. The man outside, the even from UI, a staunch unbeliever, boy, a man of principle. He said, "Senator, we will not collect one naira from you, but promise us that when we vote for you, we'll fix the road leading to the estate." When he did that, as he was walking out, the youth were waiting outside. One of them just said, "I'm the press guy. I want to ask senator a question." And they said, hey, "Sir, the question they have here, they have tail. They just wanted to give them money." And when he understood what they were saying, and he took a bay from the back, and he gave the guy was very smart. When they gave him, he took a bundle and he threw away. All of them rushed. The first guy that wanted to grab the bundle, abundance of elbows and punches on his head. <laughs> and my father stood at the gate, looking at young people beating themselves to death, bringing out weapons on the money, and he said, and all of them were students in school. That this is pathetic. We are believers, we must start. That's why I told them, it's all of you go and join political parties. If you are not there, things will work. That's the truth. All the excellent people I know, they are Christians. I know somebody that works with vice president. I can still vote for him to tomorrow. They will not collect one combo. That's the truth. We still met in someone's birthday. He writes very well. Some of you know the person I'm talking about. I can vouch for you that he will not collect 10 combo that will not belong to him. When well, they say fellowship on campus, there is a life of a Christian. That's what I'm saying. The law of money is the root of all evil. Amen. Okay. I need to know what someone can. I need to know what someone can use to resist sexual activities when the person has prayed and fasted for many years. Many years. Are you married? If you are not married, go and marry. Amen. I love being realistic. If you are above 18 and you are not married. There are times you feel like having sex. Is that true? How many of you are not married? You have felt like a few times in your life, at least a few times. Can I see your hand? I want to say honest people. You have felt like, in spite of your spirituality, you have felt like having sex. Can I see your hand? You have felt like. If you are not married and your hand is down, you are not honest <laughs> at all. There's nothing wrong with feeling. It's about what you, what you do when you feel. Even married people, at times your wife is not around, you feel like, if you can't control your feeling and the excuse is that, say, I'm not married so I can take care of myself and have it with a, girl, with a guy. What happens if your husband goes for a course or your wife goes for a course abroad? If you are separated from each other for just six months, what do you do? So the answer has to be deeper than immediate satisfaction. It has to be a self-control that comes from within. Believe that you have self-control. Meditate on that to help you. Also, to, be, to make it a practical step, at times you might need to face some activities that will divert your attention from that. See, that feeling does not stay forever. Many times it does not even last one hour. It's just a moment, maybe something turns you on. After a while, your attention goes something else and it goes. So learn to resist it, that's all. Are you with me? Praise the Lord. <laughs> Ghosts appearing to people, is it real? 
I know people say that their dead family members do appear to them, telling them things. Do ghosts appear? Well, it is appointed for man to die once. That's what the Bible says. Demons can take the image of a person and appear to somebody. So when you say ghosts, that is what happens in most cases. Amen. Yeah, things appear to people. They look like their relatives and all those things. But see, when your relative is dead, is dead. Somebody that is dead is dead. So it's a spirit that is taking up the look of that person. And it is dangerous. All right? Amen. Let's go on. Who is raising his hand? You've asked a question already. Let me start with those who have not asked. <laughs> okay. Can you give him a mic? Is it a sin wrong to be over ambitious career wise? The word ambition itself, being ambitious is not wrong if your ambition is done the right way. If you if you are if you direct it the right way. But there is a way you can. Now, if you are very ambitious, the danger can be that a time may come that you may need to suppress other people to achieve your goals. At that point, it becomes very dangerous. When you are very ambitious, what happens is that you are moving, 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 moving. You have plumbed yourself as you are. At that point, there's nothing wrong. But what about when it gets to a point that you are two at 11 and they want to appoint one of you to be leader and they're about to choose the other person? If you are over ambitious, going by that word, you will do everything and you might begin to manipulate the process to get ahead of the person. At that time, your ambition becomes very wrong and it is dangerous. Yes? It's on. Okay. okay. Um, I was getting my Bible one day and I, I got across Deuteronomy 8. I think verse 2, we were talking about God leading the Israelites to the wilderness deliberately to humble them, to protect them and all of that. And the last time Apostle Joshua Simon was here, I was talking about the fire season. So I want to know, um, how can you tell the difference between being led by God into a particular storm of life or in the wilderness and or just um, like life's, life's challenges and all that? How do you tell the difference between all that? Every experience that you have as a Christian will make you a better person if you respond the right way. We should not be bothered about where is the storm coming from. We should just know what to do part time in every situation that we face. It will build us up more. It is true some things we can't tell whether is it from God. Is it God doesn't send, send storm anyway? But why is it happening? It's not uh, too much of asking why. It's just knowing what to do part time with every situation that arises. Marijuana is becoming accepted at some at some regions. Very true. People have found test treatment from it, used medically and for recreational purposes. Should a Christian be able to use it? Mm. The Bible is very silent on marijuana. But the question is that why do you want to take marijuana? Whatever you take, whatever you take that makes you momentarily to lose possession of your mental faculty to any level, whether small or big, is dangerous for you. It will enjoy you. So, whether the Bible is silent or not, I will just counsel. Stay away from such practices. You don't need it. They take you to be high. You have the most high inside you already. So, be high under the Holy Spirit. So, you don't need it. The problem with that, what the Bible talks about, that's why abstinence from alcohol is the best. Even though the Bible talks about drunkenness, and the Bible is silent about when you are not drunk. But you see, when you start drinking, tendencies are that you will get drunk. The way the flesh is, the flesh wants more and more and more. I've always used this illustration that your flesh is like a man running 100 meters. Nobody stops on the finishing line. They cross it. Have you noticed? When people, because of what they call initial what? when you start running, you have set a principle in motion. When you slow down at the finishing line, all of you will cross it. Even the last person will cross the line. Your emotion is like that. Man is wired. When you are looking for the borderline, okay, is it okay to kiss? What about if I say? You will find out when you kiss a lady two, three, four times, next time you want something more. Next time you want something more. And then your hands will start going to where your hands should not go to. And after what that doesn't satisfy, it is the ultimate that will satisfy you eventually. So you find the So after it's better to just stop. Amen. Yeah. Okay. You have a question there. I will take the one number after. Yes. Good afternoon. Yes, ma. Okay, I hope I asked this right. Okay, so basically, you know how sometimes humans just do things for the fun of it. So say stuff like hair color 
or men wearing earrings, stuff like that. So it's not in the Bible. That's it, it doesn't say in the Bible to not do it. But do you do you think like as Christians, do we have to not do things because other people would think that we're bad? Okay, so say for me, for example, I wear colored hair, green, blue, purple, everything. But I know in this culture, it's not common. And sometimes girls that wear colored hair are seen as Ron's girls. I'm not a Ron's girl, just saying. But so I'm just saying like, because I'm a Christian now, do I, do I have to not wear, her, not wear hair color because people would think I'm a Ron's girl? It's just something along those lines. No, no, no. It, it's, um, it's your hair. <laughs> Whether it's blue, black, white, it's your hair. But you see, the issue is, is like I, you know, I've been following the same pattern as many It's not about whether something is wrong or right. It is true that most people perceive you as somebody uh, strange when you are different from them. And a lot of assum- assumptions will be made. But you see, like if a guy comes in and he's wearing a tattoo on his head and everywhere, people start looking at the guy as typically you want to brand the person as a club guy or the rest, and it might not be. Now, the question is, it's not in the rightness of the thing. It's about who we represent. I learned early in life that the way you dress is the way you'll be addressed. If I don't want, if I notice that people attach a particular look to a particular set of people, as the ambassador of Christ, even though I know I have liberty under Christ to dress like that, but for the sake of what I represent, I have to be very careful. You, you understand? Naturally, I love waves on my head. Some of you will not be in this church if you see me with waves. You know the one I love most? I love dread. I carried those thoughts when I was young. I, I promised myself that on getting university, I would just fix some. I would braid my hair and look. I just believe that I would be fine if I can braid my hair. That's it. That's it. But <laughs> as soon as I got to you, I started passing and it became that way. I mean, imagine president of a fellowship with braided hair. That was what Paul was saying that we have rights to use many things. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He said, but we have not used any of these things so that we don't become an offense to the gospel. So there are people, I, I was taught that, do things that, Bible says, follow peace with all men. Do things that people will not have things to say. Of course, people will say things, but some, you will reduce the number of those who will talk. For instance, if a pastor comes on pulpit and is wearing his stud and is like, there are some Christians that you will put off and even some unbelievers like, what's wrong with this man? But you see, nobody can have a problem if I'm on a low cut. So, when we start growing in Christ, we start doing things for other people. So, Paul said, if I eat meat, offer to idol. He said to me, idols are nothing. And that's the truth. He said, but if I see a brother around that as I begin to eat, it will affect him for the sake of that brother. So a time comes that just like parents live for their children, they are not eating but they care about their children. As you grow in Christ, you are more concerned about other Christians and other people. So you just want to do things, you know inside your heart that if I do this, there's nothing wrong with it. But for the sake of other Christians around, I will not. So it is what affects our dressing and the rest, just to be right and be able to be a blessing to many people. So that, that's the way it is. Amen. Hallelujah. On my wedding day, I wanted to wear jeans. I was just like, okay, Lord, they got this suit. I, I just wanted to do something different. But you see, I, I recognize that in a community, I still did it eventually. So we used Eta Hall for my wedding, and Eta will give you a room. When you rent their hall, they will give you a room for that night. So I, after the, uh, at the reception, they just uh, they didn't see me again. I went to the room, I removed the suit, removed the tie, removed the waistcoat. I just wore jeans and t shirt. You know, I passed by my father. I didn't know I was the one. So, <laughs> something just occurred. When, when he said I was well, he said, oh, Is everything all right? <laughs> so, I came back to the hall. So, so, that was when I could eat very well. I was just with my friends. We were all eating and talking together. And I was the groom. I went up to change. I wore palm slippers, wore jeans and t shirt, and came back to sit down inside the hall with them. And some people were looking for the groom. And I was the groom. <laughs> I love things like that. I, I just love being free. All right. Yes. Um, okay, before I take you, Michael Trek. We take some few minutes more. Yes, sir. And I will. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, actually, uh, I came to Lagos in 2006 and got kicked out 2007 by my dad. And you got I, kicked out? Yeah. 
Okay. So uh, I've been living on my own on the streets of Lagos since then. And uh, in recent time, I've grown out of love with my dad. Now, I do call him maybe once in a while when I hear messages that you should honor your dad, honor dad, dad, blah, blah, blah. I once call in him a while. Once in a while. Okay. But recently, um, I'm getting to a point in my life where I need to make a certain decision. And I don't feel like inviting my dad. Um, I don't know what to do. Okay. Well, you don't have to involve him in all decisions that are, normal, that are minor, but in major decisions. The question is that, have you truly forgiven your dad? You don't seem to... Uh, <laughs> so that is where it starts from. You see, one of the things we have to do, regardless of what your father has done to you, you are still here. I know you, Michael Trek. You have a beautiful career. Leave everything. You were thrown to the streets, but God is helping you right now. You live in your own apartment. Don't, don't look at that. Just love him. Just love him. See, many times... Parents make mistakes. The only way you will not repeat their mistake is to forgive them. This is deep. If you hold on to what they have done, it will shock you that you do the same thing. Have you noticed that sons who watch their father bashing their mom and who even defend their mom will get married and start beating their own wife also? Have you noticed that women who were victimized by their mother-in-law will grow up, their son will marry, and they will start maltreating the son's wife also? It's amazing. When evil is pushed to our courts and you don't forgive, you'll stand a chance of doing the same thing to someone else. It's always like that. Amen. Does nickname affect someone's life? Did God forbid, does God forbid smoking? <laughs> it depends on what kind of nickname. Some nicknames are horrible. If they call you Lucifer, now you should reject it because what will be coming from you will not be positive. Is it possible for a member of your family to be your enemy that can go to any leg just to see your downfall? How can someone overcome anger? Uh -uh. That third one is common in Africa now. <laughs> there are members of people's family who will go to any lengths. You see, the question our mother asked earlier, if you have never been a victim of a diabolical family, you will not understand. In Africa, wickedness is real. Ah. Uh, um, somebody told her the story. I don't know whether the guy was in uni Ben. The father had an argument with an uncle, so, and he said the father will not last time, and the father died. And he said, I'll finish the entire family. When they came to bury the father, the first man came from Germany. On his way back, he had an accident and he died. When the second born heard, they came to Rome to see at, uh, about burying the first, uh, first born, second born died. As I time the boy was talking, he was the only one left. And he was having mental there is wickedness in the world. So, can they harm a Christian if you walk in the light? No, they cannot. So, does God forbid smoking? God says nothing about smoking. But even Rotmans will say that Federal Minister of Health wants that tobacco smoking is there. So, so, that is it. Does nickname affect someone's life? It depends on which, word, which nickname. Names are powerful. The truth I can tell you is that why did God change people's name when he made them in the Bible? This is almighty God. Why can't he say that whatever I want to do to you, I will do it. I'm the almighty. I don't need anything about your name. But he changed the names. Did you notice? Abraham. When Jesus saw Simon, he said, you are a rich shaking by the way. He said, your name is Cephas, a rock. Jesus did. Hallelujah. Apostle Paul was sold. The name converted to Paul. And you will see these examples of several people that God met and he changed. Jacob said, bless me, bless me. Unless you bless, I will, let you, I will never let you go. And the angel said, so what is your name? It shows that the name was connected to the... Why? He said, bless you, but he said, what's your name? And then, how did he bless you? He just adjusted his name. He said, you are now Israel, a prince with God. And that conferred the blessing on him, just like that. So, when people give you a nickname, you have to check what kind of name. See, Satan is a, mass, is a, is a strategist. It does not have authority over a Christian except the one you permit. So you can open the door by responding to something that people are calling you that is dangerous. So check what kind of nickname. So that that's, it depends on which nickname. How can somebody overcome anger? Stop getting angry. <laughs> Hallelujah. Believe. Let the fruit of the Spirit rise. 
your human spirit is trained by the word of God. So, speak the word to yourself that you are patient, you walk in love, and you are not given to anger. After a while, your soul will recognize that that's the direction you want to take your life. That's the truth. Amen. Hallelujah. Someone's source of money is not legit. Yahoo. You are in need of money at that moment and it gives you. Is it wrong to spend it even if you are not involved in it? Knowledge is powerful. Since you know that is Yahoo. Both from a spiritual and legal perspective. If it gets into trouble with the police, you can't explain yourself out. If they trace the money to your account that I gave you some, they will carry you as well. And thou shalt call upon the name of the Lord and the Lord might not answer. Politicians have given money to people before. When EFCC went after them, they went for those people who did not really partake. So if you don't know, it's a different key. But once you know that this money, this source of this money is not clean, please don't take it. If somebody tells me in this church that you are doing an illegal business and you want to give to the church, please don't. Number one, I know that you will be, you will be, you will be tempting us with evil. Number two, a time will come that a government will arise who will do things the right way. And when they start looking at the account of churches, let it not be that illegal money will be found in our own. I get what I'm saying. That's very important. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Somebody, I've told you before, I, was, I just wanted to, my rent expired one time, and I didn't have much money on me. So I heard that a pastor was coming to Lagos. Some people here were wind in the car. We just drove past the front. I wasn't even sure whether I didn't want to attend the program. I just drove past the front of church. I just stopped. I said, when is the pastor? He said, so, so I said, so where is he staying? He said, they're pro here in GRE. I said, how much is the room? I'm paying for the room. So I gave them money I had on me. All the money. Because it was not close to what I needed. I've, I've, I don't know why people say speak against seed principle. God spoke about it. Are people manipulated people with it? Yes. When they say come out for first class, they come out for this. And I've said that times without number. Don't go out out of manipulation. Don't go out because you want God to double your money. But in Christianity, giving is legit. Galatians chapter 6, he that swears finally will raise finally. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Yes. So it is real. And it's a demonstration of our faith. So I paid for this man's room because, and in the night, about three or four nights after, I was just checking my face, and a message popped up. And somebody just said, Can you send your account number? Uh uh-uh. uh. I said, no. The first thing I did, I did as if I, was, I didn't hear. So I went to the person's profile to check who he was. Because I wasn't just, you know, if I needed anyone, I should receive from just anybody. And I saw a CV, fantastic, best student in a particular college in London. I saw him with white lecturers. Like that. So I saw those. I said, okay, no, this one is wonderful. And I didn't even know that was my friend, but I didn't know up, to, up till then. He's one of the major consultants in Nigeria, and I'm one of the youngest. And the guy sent... In 30 minutes, he sent an unusual amount to my account. I said, Lord, so you know I'm here. This is wonderful. See, it is, it is sweet. When, God is, when you are operating God's blessing, it is sweet. Others will make noise. Just make sure you don't manipulate or cheat anybody. But if you understand the fact that we can trust God for things, it is sweet. When you receive answers, it is sweet. Hallelujah. So when you know the source, so you have to. I will take you, let me read. I and my boyfriend... I and my boyfriend suit each other's specification, both physically and otherwise. Yet his own pastor says we are not meant to be together. Two years down the lane, we are still confused. None of us has moved on. We still talk to each other, still in love. What do I do? What you should do is that ignore the pastor and marry your man. If you are both born again and you are persuaded that you are meant for each other, the Bible didn't tell us that pastors should start running people. Nigeria should get weary of these prophets nowadays. And in the first place, why are you, why, if you are persuaded that this is the person you want to marry, and you are both Christians, why do you want somebody to prophesy over your head? Amen. Nigeria is now filled with prophets now. Anything, they must see a vision. I want the dear lady here now. The sister just called her from her. I mean, the sister is leaving her brother. still called and said, you know, sister, uh, there's this prophet say he saw a vision, an accident, and that's and that uh, death, and I uh, and said for him to pray, they should send some things for him to pray over. And his sister obviously has been sending money to this. I tell you, I said, listen to me. If you give him cobble, you are in bondage forever. Visions will continue, and giving will continue. 
And because you have submitted yourself to him, the day you now don't give, something bad will now happen to you. To make his prophecy look real. I said, now, I'm the pastor, I'm telling you, don't give him cover. Nothing will happen to you. Nothing. Hallelujah. Once a prophecy carries with him money, it's not from God. Somebody says that God said, I should pray for you. This will happen in your life, so come and give right now. Then no, just say, hey, 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 over there. Mm -mm. If God has said, you should tell me that God will bless me. When he blesses me, let me choose what to do. If I want to give to you, because you brought a word to me, I will. But it's my will. When you start telling me that God said, it, what you are saying is yet to have. And you are already negotiating with me. It doesn't work. Yes, let me take uh, Israel. How many more people still have questions? I want to count the number now and stop because we are supposed to. So I will take you. I will take you, ma. And I will take the lady. I will, let's stop there. Okay, you've asked once. Okay, I will take you four people. I'll be very fast with you. And yes, go on. Sir, make it brief and just we have to rush now. All right, sir. What are the things that lead to death according to your teachings in the morning? Uh, the second question is this. I made Why do you want to know? Are you committing this? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no sir. Amen. <laughs> It'll take me a time. It'll take me time to explain, actually. All right, All right sir. Yeah. Um, my second question is this. I met a friend of recent, um, we are both an engineer, we're doing the same thing, telecommunication. So um, he said he impregnated somebody. Okay. And then um, he likes the lady from the way, from the story he told me. And then he said, the lady misbehaves a lot. So while, when the wife misbehaving, she lost the pregnancy. And then, um, what is misbehaving? I mean, like <laughs> acting in a very funny way, like in short, is she saucy, she's abusive, okay. and she uh, like that, sir. Uh, she so, loves the baby, okay. So, what's, what's the question? Go on, uh, yes, sir. Um, I try to, I've been under your teaching for years, sir. Uh, so, I try to answer. Israel, ask your question. What is the question? <laughs> the question is, um, how does he overcome this? How does it come out of it? Because I try to answer the... Are they married? They are not, but they live in the same compound, different flats. They are not married. No, sir. The lady misbehaves. It is it's totally... It doesn't like her attitude. Yes, sir. She was pregnant and she has even lost the baby. Yes, sir. That has helped them. <laughs> I'm not happy that the baby is lost, but I'm just saying that there's no point of... It will be funny for him to go... If, if you... See, we, many times people have to define what they call love. I think that's the problem. Listen, if somebody is irritating you and you claim to love the person, you don't understand love. You can't swallow something sweet and bitter at the same time. Once somebody is always irritating you, people don't change after the marriage, the cycle continues. You date at times to know the compatibility that you have with the person. Once you notice that, look, this is not my type of person, just go. We must not be bound to people. We meet people so that we can know whether we can tag along. Once you meet and you see that you are not compatible, then go your way. So tell your friend, if he sees that there are too many dangerous things about the lady, move on. She will find her husband. Maybe that they will flow together. Okay? Very simple. Amen. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the question I'm about to ask is, controversy uh, as a matter of fact i've heard it with my friends and the look they gave me wasn't all right so the question is i think marriage and ch giving back to children is an achievement not the achievement the achievement is actually fulfilling your uh, fulfilling destiny your yes. purpose in life and I, I told my friends i said i'm okay I, lo I would love to get married. I would want to have children. But I told my friends that I'm okay if it doesn't happen. And if the marriage doesn't happen and if the children doesn't happen. And the response I got, it made me doubt the <laughs> essence of my, like, okay. I understand so. you very well. African societies is like that. We are more like that than whites. Whites are not like that. Africans will start saying, once you're a woman and you're getting to 30 and you're not married, people start looking and say something is wrong with you. 
sincerely speaking, the grace you have, the way you feel, feel free to be who you are. I love your stand. I love to get married. But if it doesn't happen, it doesn't bother me. There are people like that. There's nothing wrong. Even though, be careful you say that too. They will make you look like the devil for saying so. To an average person, to say that you don't care whether you marry or not, it's as if you are blaspheming. And people rush in. What do they get from there? They rush out. Hatred, anger, reported to in law, separation, and that's all they get. So it's not compulsory. Marriage is not compulsory. Paul was not married, so you don't have to. Amen. It's a good thing. You desire it, but if it doesn't happen that way, I mean, just that's that. so. Not everybody will marry, actually. It's difficult to say, but that's the truth. Let me take the next person before we move into can a believer lose one salvation? Eternal security. Okay. <laughs> and we answer that in the well. Amen. It created serious issues on Facebook last year, back and forth. Um, the simple thing I would say to whoever wrote that question that the question you are not asking is because the argument of those who say it cannot happen is that they believe that what Jesus did that I, no. <laughs> I enjoy it a lot when I read are you saying the man said that I think to my family that around somebody took him up how can you say Christian come back are you saying what Jesus did cannot, it's not permanent how, and then they will quote he's able to save unto all times those who uh, that what Jesus did is permanent what Jesus did is permanent but what Jesus did is being received by a mortal man The question you are now answering that my shirt is permanent, let's say. But the question, can I remove my shirt or not? Jesus made salvation available. We came to receive. What of if I reject it? Will he force it on me? So I told somebody that don't create a Jesus Christ that forces you to stay with him. The spirit of God forces nobody. Then he kept quiet. Papa Egil spoke about this. That is a sin leading to death. A person can walk away from Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about those who walk away. The Bible talks about that those who crucified the son again who counted the blood as something unworthy. The question they should ask is that can an act make a Christian? No. An act cannot. A Christian commits adultery. That cannot make him lose salvation. You can lose salvation the way salvation came. He came by confessing Jesus as Lord. If you say Jesus is not Lord again, and there is a lie that the blood was shed, then you've lost your salvation. Isn't it? How did you get it? So you want to tell me that a Christian who says the blood is a lie, the death of Jesus did not happen. Resurrection never took place. Jesus never rose. Is he our salvation? You know, they actually told someone, and he was arguing on Facebook, yes, is he our salvation? Really? He accepted it by confession. The Bible says, with heart man believes unto righteousness, and with mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you don't believe again and you confess that it's all a lie, then you are not saved again. That's all. So, can act get a person now? No. But can a belief get you out? Yes, because you came in by belief, you can also work out by belief. Is that understood? That's it. Praise the Lord. So that talks about, so I don't believe for, so I mean, I've heard that there's so much argument in among the body of Christ about this back and forth. The Calvinists, I've read history about this and everything, but I, I do not believe that if you say those things, you are still a believer. Amen. Okay, who is the next person? Okay, yes, ma'am. I want to take this question from the point of a woman. Yes, ma'am. A woman that is married and... Um, the man becomes, um, he starts to, how would I put it? He starts to misbehave in the marriage. And out of his misbehavior, he got somebody else pregnant. And issues came up. He goes and after like, maybe one year, he comes back and says he wants the marriage to continue. After another one year, one year he goes and comes back again and says, you know, so when it gets to that point and the woman decides to say i don't want any more i want a divorce is it wrong for is it is it a sin to now say for the woman to say i want a divorce i want to move on is it a sin amen i would rather we use the word do we have such instruction in the bible i don't like when we say is it a sin as if we are dodging and counting sin. You know, that question is called, but I understand your question. 
Um, the Bible is not against divorce. And nobody is against divorce. What people are against is remarried. Whether you can remarry or not. That's what people are against. Because Paul said clearly, if a party is not willing to dwell, that person can go. But Paul is silent about when the person goes, what happens to the other person? But he also answered somehow. He said, he used the word unknown. He said, if you are married to a non-believer, and there are many Christians behaving like a non-believer. He said, if you are married to a non-believer, and the unbeliever wants to go, he said, let them go. He said, in that case, you are not under the law. That is the problem that theologians have a problem with. So they are saying that, it's Paul saying, when the person goes, the law that forbids you from marrying someone else is now lifted. Why some say that? No, it's only saying that the law that keeps you together is lifted. Well, if the law that keeps you together is lifted, then I think you're also free to remarry. For a long time, the church believes that under no condition can anybody remarry. But if somebody walks away to go and impregnate somebody, and over and over again, and the woman is here, uh, I, I believe, the question is, as a minister, will I join the, such a woman? I will join her very well. If I'm wrong, God will forgive me. Sincerely. Because we have seen things. God said in Old Testament, I hate divorce. In New Testament, he wants husband and wife to be together. No doubt about that. But God also doesn't force people. So the Bible gives a room that if somebody walks away, you are not under the law. So I interpret it to be that Paul actually said that you are free if the person walks away. So, and Jesus gave a reason. He said, do not, he said, a man should not put away. So he said, except for sexual immorality. So that means when sexual immorality is involved, the scenario has changed. So that is it. What about the example that somebody who took a, when left his wife and went to marry someone else abroad and called and said, I better get another man, I'm not coming back again. And they are both in their 20s. What will she do? You know, I believe that the Bible says that whatever yoke as a pastor will put on people, put it on your own head first. God forbid a pastor has a daughter and that happens to her daughter, his daughter and daughter is 27. I will tell your daughter for the next 60 years of her life to remain like that. So, we will not violate the word, but since the word says somebody walks away, you are not under the law, I believe that. So, that one is not interested in marriage, you should let him go. When he comes next time, the lady should give him red card. He should go away. Amen. Some men are mean, and it's wrong. Amen. Praise the Lord. Somebody, has, somebody told me also, somebody here told me, his wife, when they got married, they found the wife pregnant, and not by him, and not by Holy Spirit. <laughs> For another man. And eventually she told the guy. I mean, he was talking to me after service one day, a, and you know this, this is a very wonder when he was talking to me I said ah there's so much love in this guy yo. I think he went to do masters abroad and then she got pregnant for someone else I know the funny thing he told her that okay let's start all over again I will let you give the child when it's like a, a year or two to the man but we we'll continue I still love you they continue for a one lady told him one that he said my conscience can't carry that I feel like I don't belong to you that when you were where I was sleeping with my former boyfriend, that was how I got pregnant, and that there's likelihood that I will go back to the person if you travel again. So let it end. And he was trying to talk her into not going. When he told me he was persuading her, I was like, <laughs> but you know, I was just listening to that persuade. I thank God for one grace to manage myself. When I was secondary school, you I vowed. If a girl says you don't like me, I too, I don't like you. It's called balance of terror. It makes life beautiful. That I will sit down on my bed and you are, you are doing like this. Because a girl said no to you. And then you carry gift to give her. She, still say, she will say no. Some guys who need sense. You are buying things. You are at her beck and call. Carrying her around in your car. And every time you ask, she will say, I thought we are friends. And you are still doing that. Go use your energy for someone else. Maybe there are, there are final ladies who are looking at you, but they think there's something between you and that's why they have left you. Hey, don't waste time till your person will pass. All ladies say, if a guy is dancing around you for too long and he's not saying anything, call him to order. This one that you come to my house day and night, and you are not talking. I need to know where you stand. Stand or fall out. Very simple. See, you, you, you don't know gentlemen, good men, will not 
try to as they will not try to force their way into you. So maybe he keeps seeing you with that person and he assumes that that's the person you are dating. If he's a gentleman, he stays off. Now, this guy waste your waste your time for three years. He will now go and ask out somebody else, and your heart is broken. But you gave room for it. Don't let any man waste your time. Once he's becoming a friend and he's getting very close and he's not saying anything, please ask him that direct question. Sorry, what is going on here? I need to know. Tell him I'm a very purposeful person. I need to know what is going on. Are you in or out? Not one leg in like Uticos, one leg out. It's important. Amen. Hallelujah. So that's what I can say about that person, man. It's not. Who is at fault? Have I taken all the questions? Okay, last person. Let me just. Okay. Oh, two, okay. One, one. That's all. Just take care. How are you? My Seralonian friend. She's a Seralonian. Good evening, Pastor Shola. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. So, my question is about ghosts. When, um, say, if you see a ghost, it's a familiar spirit. So, in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel 28, where um, Saul was to fight with the Philistines. I understand. They got a medium to raise Samuel from To the raise dead. Samuel. So, is that a familiar spirit? Yes, or it was a familiar was spirit. But God will never allow his prophet to be raised by a witch. Okay. It was a witch that raised Samuel, so it wasn't Samuel. Okay. A soothsayer can tell you things that prophets of God can tell you. That's why I warn people that they go to, people just get moved when they say somebody's prophesying, somebody's giving a word or none. Native daughters can do that. Those who are familiar speak can look at you and tell you what you've never told anybody. You see, in this realm, there's darkness over this realm that doesn't enable you to see beyond the five senses. Even you step above this realm, it's an open realm. You can see things that ordinary people cannot see. And you can step beyond this realm by the spirit of God or by evil spirits. So there are things that the Holy Spirit knows and Satan knows also. Evil spirits know, they know things. That's why they are called familiar spirits. They are familiar with activity, so they know. And they can tell things. So that girl that had evil, that had evil spirits in that chapter 16 was following Paul and Silas. And he said, these are servants of God. She knew who they were. And Paul told the Spirit to get out of her. These are the educations that Nigerian church needs. Too many Christians out there, once they say a prophet can prophesy, they start submitting, let me pray about this, let me pray about that, and they get into trouble. God did not design a New Testament Christian to be ruled by a prophet. You have the Spirit of God. A prophet can confirm what the Lord is already telling you. But if, if somebody tells you something in the name of any prophecy, and it does not bear any witness, you are drop it. Don't receive anything that you have no business carrying. Too many people go around to places in Africa nowadays. So it wasn't the spirit of God. It was not somewhere that was raised. It was another spirit. Amen. Yeah. Good evening, Pastor. Yes, ma'am. Um, my question is, um, actually something happened in my, uh, my son's school last week. A friend of his lost his life. He committed suicide. And I asked my son the reason why that happened. The one in Unilag. In Unilag, yes. And I asked why that happened. I was told that um, along the line from year one that um, the boy never liked, liked um, his parents. Anytime they're on break, he doesn't go home. He just stayed back at school. They just finished their project. And the next thing we heard that um, he took his life. He took um, a sniper and just wow. died. Just last week. Now, my question is, um, probably the boy went into depression and took his life. Would that be counted as, you know, you know um, counted to him as sin? And we also, his parents were judged because something would have happened that, you know, drove him into depression. Okay. Thank you, sir. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, depressions are never from God. They are, many times, they are the kind of demonic oppression. Many of us have been victimized by parents and people, but you didn't take your life. <laughs> Actually, Africans don't die easily. Whites are very prone to something like that. Somebody says you are ugly, she will go and lock her room and then kill herself. One day I was watching CNN, I was so irritated when they were talking about cyber bullying. Somebody being bullied on Facebook. I said, they tired there. You open your device, somebody, uh, somebody is bullying you. I can understand somebody bullying you in class. On social media, can't you unfriend the person and you are committing suicide on somebody? I said, this, this is an attack. You open your Facebook, somebody is saying that you this ugly something. Why don't you type also, you too, you are ugly. <laughs> Both. 
just went. <laughs> you know, whites are very funny. And the parents came and they called a counselor and they were trying to counsel her that now she's entering into depression. So people were victimizing her on social media. I said, is it by force she looks at Facebook? In the first place, use your data for something else. They will bully you when they see you there. And who is bullying you? Say, you, you know, you can't type. Anyway, suicide is not normal. It's abnormal. Um, if a person is under demonic influence, like oppression, and the person kills himself, once it is beyond the person's will, then it cannot be counted against the person. When Papa Egi was asked this question, he puts it this way, that if a Christian is sick of cancer, and he prays and he prays and he's not ill and he dies, will God judge him? No. He gets to heaven and there's no sickness again. Whatever is beyond a man's will, a man cannot be judged for it. So if somebody takes his life in the name of under an umbrella of suicide because of depression beyond their control, I don't think... Some people will say they will go to hell, but I don't think so. Sometimes you see that they open up for demons to take possession of them and to make them do those things. So it's a dangerous thing. But I do not think it will be counted against them. That one, if I'm wrong, has that to be corrected, but I don't think it will count against them. Amen. For the parents, well, parents make mistakes from time to time. Yeah, they could have helped the boy. God will not be happy with what they have done. But if they repent, they'll be forgiven. Really. The beauty of Christianity is that somebody can do something bad to somebody. The person can go on in the name of God and, and perish. And the one who caused the whole problem can repent and be saved. So it can be like that. But on earth, till they repent, the parents are held responsible. Because God commits your children into your hand and you are their custodian and you will answer for what is going on in their lives. It's a great responsibility taking care of children. Because you are going to give account about each one. That's very important. Very, very important. When all parents know this, you'll take the work of remodeling your children very seriously. The boy can be three and you are talking to him many hours. You see, personally, I believe this came as a revelation from God to me personally. People do not know why their children become great and they abandon them. If your child is three, four, and you treat them anyhow, not even that you beat them, you just don't see anything much about it. They are calling, they want to ask you a question, don't want to answer them. They too might become great. They will not know why. And you two are trying to ask them for something and they are not responding. When these people are small, when you are blessed with a child, treasure them. Be their teacher, be their mentor. I tell parents here that you should be the mentor to your children. They can say, who is their mentor? My father. Then they can say, after my father, whoever they like. But you should be the first mentor. Don't miss the opportunity of occupying that space in their life between when they are two and when they are ten. Be their best friend. Enter into them until you build the image you want to see in them. It's, very, it's a very wonderful thing to do. When they want to talk to you, listen very well. Listen. Now the children know more than you think they know. It's a privilege. That's why I won't ever tell anybody to abort. It's a privilege. To bring a life into the world, it's a privilege. So that's why sometimes you don't look at, is this sin a sin? You look at, what will I get doing this? Will God be proud of me if I do this? Yes. Bring this child to the world. People will talk. If you are a member of this church, we don't expect you to live wrong. But if you do, you are still our sister. We love you. Don't add fuel to the fire by saying that what people will say and because of your reputation, you terminate the life. No. We are not ashamed of We will correct you that you shouldn't have done that, but we love you. You have this life inside you. Bring this life to the world. Let's celebrate this life. It might be the next person that will change the fortune of this nation. It's important. It's a blessing to have life in your hand. It's a blessing. I pray for a lot of people believing God for the fruit of the womb. If you see the travail of those who are trusting God for a child, you will value one when you have. Amen. Who is at fault? Father or mother? If a girl child was molested at a very young age and everywhere she goes, it's from one sexual abuse to another. Her parents keep telling her that she has a calling. How can the calling come to pass with the hurt and pain that she has passed through from her childhood? I perceive this person you're asking for yourself. You are just putting, that's what I perceive. I don't mind talking with you, really. Don't look at who should be blamed. Look at more at what should be done about this. 
Joyce Meyer went through the same. There's a bad experience. I don't wish anybody to go through this, this kind of thing. So why is it happening to this person repeatedly? One is evil and terrible enough. Now, when it's happening repeatedly, why? Who are, who are you staying with and where are you going to that they are taking advantage of you like this? And in Jesus' name, I might be able to help if I know this. But if it's a matter of staying in the wrong places, we can do something about where you stay. We can do something about that. I don't like hearing ladies being molested and all those things. We can do something about that if it's about. So let me know. I can see the person after the meeting. Now, don't look at whoever comes to see me as the person. Many people will see me after this meeting. So, you know, in the church, we have people who play different roles. Some are in secret service. <laughs> Amen. Have I answered all questions? There are still some. 26. No, I will take one more. Last one. Last one. <laughs> God will answer all of them. <laughs> In Jesus' name. It's a question very serious. You look bothered. <laughs> you are bothered with something. For someone. Please give her the mic. I will take, the, just project, that, this is the last one I will take. The rest, send it to my box. I will try and type an answer to them as the Lord grants me grace. Let me just answer this lady. I've been standing for forever today. Sorry, uh, my team Chelsea is playing today, so I want to see uh, the um, best team on that. So let's see. So uh, um, there's this lady. She said... Uh, I hope she they are not beating us already. Because <laughs> <laughs> I have many enemies in this. So anytime Chelsea loses, I will rejoice. Mm -hmm. I don't know what kind of members we have here. They will take time to greet me after service. Because they want to say, Pastor, do what Chelsea's might say. Say, Pastor, good afternoon, sir. I will say good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. They are trying to say, a pastor, yesterday, somebody said, Ekwa, no. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Go on. Okay, so there's this friend of mine. She has been dating this guy for like about seven months. And uh, the guy has been doing everything at his pace to satisfy her. Like, anything she wants, actually. But she doesn't love the guy. And the guy is about to ask her hand in marriage. What can be done? Well, I feel sorry for the guy and I feel sorry for the lady. Okay, no, the, the thing there is she's like, okay, should Does she, that want can to she marry? go ahead and marry, but that she feels maybe along the line she can fall in love with the guy. It buys her a lot of things. Do love grow with time? Yeah, it has happened with some people. But see, if gifts are involved and he's doing things for her, you can't authenticate the whole thing. She cannot, she doesn't love him and it will show later. When you don't, you know what it means to live in a room with somebody that you don't really, really, I will tell now. So, amen. What can somebody do to stop masturbation cause from remembering your past experiences in having sex with different girls whenever you are alone? What you can do is to stop it. A temptation resisted. When you are always masturbating, when you try to stop, after hearing a word or something, it stops for a while. When it tries to come again, I will give you the practical step. Get the word of God and listen to some messages, when you listen to them, they set up your spirit, purify your soul, and help your body to say no. If I want to pray extra, I just have some messages I listen to. I'll just start praying. Apostle Man is one of the people that can send into prayer. They just want to pray. So he gave gifts unto men. When I want to do serious Bible study, there are ministers I listen to. When I read some things about E.W. Kenyon, you want to study the word more. If I want to study more of Old Testament stories, there are people I listen. So, the word helps us. Thoughts are words inside. Words are thoughts expressed outside. So you use words to deal with them. That's it. If I ask you to count 50, if you are thinking about something right now, you are thinking seriously about it, if I ask you to count 50, when you start counting, you cannot coordinate your thoughts again. Why counting? You can interpret what is going on inside by what you do on the outside. So that's the case with masturbation. Begin the process of confessing the word of God that you are a new man in Christ. Pray in tongues, then check the word. Once the urge is there, do something. When the evil spirit goes out of the man, he seeks for a place. 
if the place is empty, it's going to come back. That's what will happen. I told somebody who used to be addicted to pornography. Now that you are stopped and God has I pray for the power, say, please, fill the space with something else, otherwise it will come back. The space has to be filled. It has to be filled. There are files that have to be deleted and replaced with something new. When we condemn the old habit and don't develop the new ones, the old ones will come back. Is that okay? Praise the Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus. So, we've come to the end today. Don't worry, there will be another one. Anytime the Lord leads us again, I will be able to answer more questions. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you for your time. I love you all. And if I didn't answer your question, don't worry, Jesus will answer them through someone else. Just pray. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of our broadcast. You know, we never like to end without giving you an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Coming into Christ is beyond joining a church, is beyond a religion. It is joining God's family. And that is done when you believe in Christ Jesus. So I just want to lead you right away now. If you are, if you want to give your heart to Christ, just say after me, say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died and rose again and that you paid for my sins. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. And from today, I belong to you. If you have said those words, will be late. You are born again. You are part of God's family right now. You can go ahead and rejoice about it. And if you want to contact us, just check. The address is written on the screen. God bless you. We love you. Stay blessed.